This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. No, no, no. Cut that. Keep that. Someday it's going to be worth something. Russ Wakelin. You put me in an ATST with freaking Wookiees attacking me and whatnot? Now you're talking. And Jeff Inglestein in the third chair. E to the pi i plus one equals zero. With contributions from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listeners. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Covered at the speed of a giant Eldari wraith knight, bristling with weapons, traipsing with dainty strides across a grim, dark landscape. Today's edition is brought to you by all of our friends at Patreon, the men, the women, the boys, the girls, the dogs, the cats that keep us going day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, episode after episode, lengthy episode after lengthy. Anyway, uh, today it's Keith Shutters, Noah Siemens, Pedro Sierra, Andrew Sipes, Alan Slikinski, Bill Smith, Stephen... So direct Stanley, Co- oh, and then it's all messed up, and then Ken Squires. Ah, I'm Geek Limited, your host today. Our panelists are Russ, the world's end, Wakeland, and preeminent game designer, father of the year, and the professor everyone wishes they had, Jeff Andromeda Strain, Engelstein. Let's bring in issue number one. As we get older, our interests naturally shift and change. One year we might check in engrossed with medieval farming working worker placement games. Well, only a few short years later, maybe it's processing hipsters and cows for alien consumption that catches our fancy. The key, however, regardless of the particulars, is that our interests are always evolving and present interests should never be used to deter oneself from going back to something that once was fun. Question. In the 30-some-odd years since Warhammer 40,000 first hit the international gaming scene, there have been many choices, changes, and trades. Some have been very good. Some have been very bad. However, what was the official canon date of the introduction of 40K into the real historical timeline year called? Rogue Trader Russ. Uh, The 44th millennium. Senator Jeff. Uh, January 1st, 39,997. That's well. Jeff did some math, so that was good. Russ's could not possibly be correct in any way. Uh, sadly, Jeff was going in the wrong direction. That would be year nine hundred and eighty-seven point M two, or the nine hundred and eighty-seventh year of the second millennium. Which, for those of you who need help, would be nineteen eighty-seven by our reckoning. Which makes you both wrong. Issue number two. As summer movie blockbusters vie for preeminence in a crowded field and audiences seem to be growing more and more demanding while at the same time appearing less and less forgiving, several films stand out so far as stellar examples of their genres. At the top of that heap, of course, is Infinity Wars. Ten years in the making, bringing the cast of more than 12 individual movies and mini-franchises into one action-packed extravaganza. There is so much here that is unprecedented that it was bound to break records across the world. Question. Avengers Infinity Wars did indeed break many records. One of the most impressive was for advanced ticket sales. How many of the previous Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe movies combined did Infinity Wars beat with its advanced ticket sales? Remembering Black Panther, the previous record holder, was right before it. Rainboy Russ. This question sounds familiar, so I'm going to go with all of them again. Ah, Jetstream Jeff. Four. Interesting. This uh, question was familiar, lost as it was to time. Russ actually heard this question only <laughs> ago and still managed to get it wrong. Seven. Seven of the previous films. It beat Avengers Age of Ultron by a factor of 1,000. Oh, I should have got that wrong. Right. It, it beat Black Panther by a factor of 250. It's crazy stuff, man. That's a lot of money on the table. Issue number three. When one studies ancient civilizations, one cannot escape the region known as Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, nestled warmly in the embrace of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And if one were to look for an ideal location to set a game focused on culture, trade, and civilization, one could do much worse than this region in the period around 3100 BC to 300 BC, when many of the most important advancements occurred. Question. However, much like farming and a piece of ma- making a peaceful farming game in the violent and bloody dark ages, one might think a trading game set in the Fertile Crescent would pose its own interesting issues. What was the name of the Sumerian king of Lugash who unified the Mesopotamian region briefly before it devolved once again into constant warfare among the many city-states situated there, which also apparently had a lot of trading involved? Rimush Russ. His friends called him Bob. Judea Jeff. Now, this is a real problem for me because I've actually majored in ancient history. So the fact that I'm going to screw up this question is wholly embarrassing, but I'm going to go with a cod. 
That's unfortunate because you probably would have pronounced it a lot better than I'm about to. <laughs> His name was Inatum. Inatum. In Inatum. Inatum. <laughs> anyway, makes you both wrong. Issue number four. Over the past few years, there have been several attempts to bring gaming into the documentarian realm. Oh, from 2012's Going Cardboard to the fantastical-ish Dwarvenaut starring Stefan Pacorni himself, there are literally scores. Okay, a score. Okay, maybe 10-ish. Documentaries about gaming. Not computer games. There's a ton of those, apparently. Anyway, looks like we could really use a good forum for documentary treatment like of tabletop games, eh? Especially miniatures games, eh? With a, maybe a Canadian bent, eh? <laughs> Question. According to Board Game Geek Topic, Board Game Documentaries Worth Watching, in what year was the earliest such documentary Scrabble on? Yep, there's a 51-minute documentary on Scrabble. Just Scrabble. What year was that released? Rhapsodic Russ. 1983. Overjoyed Jeff. 1964. Interestingly enough, that's another question that Russ has recently heard. <laughs> Last time. 2003. Scrabble <laughs> came out in 2000. It's been out for 15 years. How have we not already seen this? Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and good night. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Lone Wolf Development. Take your game to the next level. And by Geek Nation Tours. Rise up and join the Geek Nation touring the world at geeknationtours.com and by audible try the service get a free book and support the show all by visiting audibletrial.com slash d6g hello 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 Ooh, that was a long hey. time out. hello welcome to episode 240 craig 240 sounds very impressive it sounds like we're winding down here of the D6 generation. I'm Russ Wake crashing, crashing behind us any moment now. I'm Craig Galan. And I'm Jeff Engelsey. Apparently, I talk too much. Hey, Jeff. Hey. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, really excited to be here. We are always super excited to have Jeff on the show. Mr. Math himself. Uh, it's, an old, very... it's like an old friend just coming and hanging out. It is. It's just like that. Um, it's no so... stress for us, and we like it that way. Yeah. So how you been, Jeff? How many conventions you going to lately? It feels like you've been to a few. <laughs> I have been to a fair amount. I, I've been trying to actually cut back a little bit this year, but it doesn't really seem to be helping. So, yeah, I, uh, you wouldn't I went, know it from your Twitter feed. Let's no, you it. wouldn't. I went to the Gathering of Friends. I went to the new Tabletop Network Conference out in Utah, which was a, a game design conference, not not uh, like vendors and stuff like that, but just about uh, seminars about design. Um, right. going to Dice Tower Con, uh, which I guess already happened by the time this is aired, and uh, right. going to Gen Con, and uh, perhaps even Essen, so we'll see. So I've got a pretty busy wow, schedule. Wow, Essen, you, you've got, a, you've got wow. a big year ahead of you. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yep. Oh, I'm PAX so, Unplugged. Can't oh, and oh, yeah, I'm going to PAX Unplugged again this year. That yep. was fun. Yep, that was. That. that was awesome. So looking forward to that as well. So Jeff, since Jeff is a preeminent game <laughs> designer, I would argue like a thought leader in the realm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair? If you will. I feel like I feel that's fair. So we thought maybe we'd chat with uh, with Jeff a bit about game design here later in the episode. And then, of course, also, we managed to corner a Canadian, Craig. Yeah, we did. Uh, a Canadian was cornered. Not that, cor it's not that hard to corner a Canadian. They're too. No, they're very friendly and polite. So uh, we, we cornered Terrace and got them to give us an update. Also, what's going on with Geek Nation Tours later this episode as well. But before we get all that, Craig, do you remember what we spoke with Rafe about? When we caught him, caught up with him in uh, the okay. Dunkin' Donuts. I'm going to pull the curtain away for a moment, which, of course, everybody knows Russ hates. I'm just going to yes. mention that we had a massive technical failure that cost us half mm. an episode last month. And yes. Including the two questions that I retreaded in uh, Rapid Fire, which <laughs> set Jeff up for a, a huge shenanigans claim if Russ had managed to get half <laughs> questions correct which <laughs> right so we don't have to worry about that but i i barely remember uh there like so there was okay so there was one we talked about infinity war right but mm -hmm. that wasn't yeah, the yeah, one with yeah. rafe no the one with rafe we talked about you want me to help you out yeah you're gonna have to help me out we can make a kessel run in a really short distance oh solo that's right yes, yes. 
Yes. We talked about how much we enjoyed Solo and we don't understand all the hate. We don't. Jeff, have you seen Solo? Uh, I did not get to see it yet, but I, I, so, that's not because of like I'm poorly disposed towards it or anything. It's just my schedule. So it's you're just one crazy. of the reasons. You're one of the reasons the the movie didn't do well, and now they're Correct. thinking of not doing more of these Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, that's I. You can lay all the blame at my feet. So I feel like Jeff, we need a little help here. You need to go watch all the Star Wars movies twice, please. Uh, okay, um, I'll get. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> I mean, I do you like the Star Wars movie stories, or do you think? Like, oh yeah, sure. Movie? No, I love Star Wars. No, I I love Last Jedi. I okay. I thought that the hate directed against that was completely misguided. Okay, well, good. Well, we we do talk about Solo. We love Solo. Uh, we loved Rogue One. Um, I, I thought they were stronger than Last Jedi, but I enjoyed Last Jedi too. So I'm I'm, I'm I, I can't have too much Star Wars, but that's just me. Maybe um maybe there's something about me that's a little weird. Um, so if you want to hear us talk about all that, Craig, what should folks do to be able to listen uh, well, to a Lost? Let's see, uh, the standard would be to go to the d6generation.com and click on the link you'll find on the right hand side that goes to Patreon, and then it'll go directly to our Patreon page where you'll be able to watch a video if you really want. The key is basically what you're going to do is you're going to pledge a little support to the show and kick a little tip into the chip tip jar that's going to go in uh, every time we launch an episode. And so you can choose whether you support us for maybe 50 cents all the way up to some outrageous, ridiculous amount. If you had a lot of money just laying around that you wanted to get rid of. And if you pledge a $2 pledge per episode or more, it unlocks the entire uh, vault of uh, lost chapters. So that is now hundreds of additional hours of the D6 generation that you can listen to that maybe you never listened to before. But it does not actually include the chapter you really lost. It does. Oh, actually, no, we did not lose a, a loss. <laughs> yes. Oddly enough, we lost. What we did lose, really a shame, because Russ and I both put a lot of work into this, was the in-detail review of uh, Drop Fleet Commander. Yeah, that was a shame. That and was a shame. That Drop was a Fleet Commander is a game that we both loved and continue to love, and... Uh, I think, I think. Was, do you remember what our review was? I mean, what our, what our, <laughs> well, I think we need to do a D6G uh, pip for that one, Craig. A little, uh, a little single pip a little, on that we one. We should do a D6G a little, little, pip. Just yeah, we should. We'll, we'll, one. More, about, more about that later. That's called a <laughs> teaser, Craig. Yeah, that, ooh, well done, Russ. <laughs> uh, but what's, Excellent. what's the time now for, Craig? Time for me to move all this stuff, reach over here and go. Achievements in gaming. That's right. And achievements, of course, brought to us by all of our patrons over there at Patreon, helping keep the lights on. We really appreciate all that. So, Jeff, what have you been playing lately? A master game designer like yourself, you must be playing games continually. We're on the clock 24 uh, 7. Yeah, well, um, close to 24 7, but a lot of it is play testing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, this, which is why you know my game group has abandoned me because they're tired of playing my game. Uh. pieces of garbage but uh, uh we've been working hard on um the newest game that we had announced uh from gmt games uh called versailles 1919 which is about the uh signing negotiations and the uh, preparation of the treaty at the end of world war one that became the treaty of versailles that had a lot of has had tremendous impact on the world uh to, even to this day so it's so in that game are you writing the treaty you are yeah you're one of either the uk the us france or italy and you are working on preparing the treaty and deciding you know which issues are happening where the rhineland's going what the league of nations is going to look like and shape, oh, cool. shaping all of the world history so i've been co-designing that with mark herman who did um churchill and he's he's a huge war game designer he's done like 70 odd games so it's been a tr- he's i'm a huge fan of his and so it's been a tremendous treat to work with him on that so we just broke the P500, and um, that's going to be coming out sometime in 2019, which is the 100th anniversary of the signing of the treaty. So, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like a coincidence that 1919 is coming out in 2019. Yeah, right? yeah, because, you know, everyone's on the edge of their seat for the Treaty of Versailles <laughs> celebrations. Centennial. I know I am. I know I am. So I was going to fly to Versailles myself, and now i got to buy a yes. game. Yes, so it's just, it's just part of my never-ending quest for commercial Are you going to have a little booth set up outside? Are you going to have a little booth set up outside Versailles where you're selling the board games right there? And uh, uh, absolutely, you know? yes. I yes. feel like that should be a thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, but I have been playing a few actual games. Um, one um, which has been found a lot of press is I actually think it was up for this build jar is the Mind. Um, are you guys familiar with this game? I am not. How does it work? Okay, it's 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 really cool because you can teach it in like three seconds, and it's a deck of uh, cards numbered from one to a hundred, just one of each. And the first round, uh, each person gets one card, 
face down and it's cooperative and you are just trying to play the cards face up into a pile in the middle of the table in numerical order from lowest to highest but you're not allowed to say anything or indicate the card that you have so you just have to give people knowing glances and pause and wait and use body yeah. language and then if you all do it with one then each person gets two cards and you so then there's you know if you're playing with four people there's eight cards out and you have to play them in numerical order and you basically have three lives you can make three mistakes as you pass other rounds you get certain abilities extra lives and things that'll help you out but that's basically the game and you have to get to like a certain level um i've made it as high with four players as as level eight where each person has eight cards and you're just trying to mm -hmm. play them one at a time in numerical order going up just by kind of staring down people and leaning back and leaning forward and raising your eyebrow and it's it's a lot of people say it's not a game but it's i i think it is and it's i think it's a lot of fun too so that uh, came out really in cool. Germany. It's just coming into the U.S. right now. So it's called the Mind. The Mind. I'm keeping an eye out for that one. Yeah, sounds like something right up Russ's alley. I like those kind of games. And it's easy with a group, you know group anywhere. You can just grab people, and you don't have to tell the rules. Just get everybody a card and say, "Okay, this is what we're going to do." So go uh, right, right. I've also been playing. I finally got a chance to play Spirit Island um, from Greater Than Games. The also a co-op um, where you are playing an angry island god defending the island against uh, colonizers. Um, yep. and that's, uh, I, I've been wanting to try that one for a while. It's got some really, um, interesting card mechanics. Sadly, we, we lost and our Island was overrun, but, um, I definitely want to try that one again. There's a lot of different gods that you can be all that all have different cards and different powers and work together. So, um, that's, that's, that's a really fun one with a unique theme. Have you guys had a chance to try that one either? I have not, but it sounds okay. like another game I would really enjoy. That cool. <laughs> so you're already, you're already leading me down a path of new games to yes, try. Yes, that's why I'm the gaming Pied Piper. That's why I'm here today. Exactly right. <laughs> there's, a, like, there's a certain amount of Schottenfreuden in our <laughs> audience whenever you show up because we make them spend money and then you come on and make us spend money. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I blame you. Well, then you're going to love this last one. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, so this is Decrypto. Um, and I probably should look at the publisher before I came on here, but it's a word game. If, if you guys, uh, I assume you've played code names and, uh, yes. like code names, it's, awesome. it's really kind of similar to that. Um, so it's two teams again. Mm -hmm. Um, but in this case, a team knows all the words. Uh, so, so one team, they have all their words in front of them and they know they have four words. Um, and so they will be numbered from one to four. And then you have to, you, you'll, if you're the clue giver for your team for that round, you'll you'll get a card and it'll say like three, one, four, for example, which means you have to give them three clues, one for the third word, one for the first word, and one for the fourth word. Um, and um, so you give them the three clues and your team has to get it right and say what they are. Um, and, but the other team writes that down and they say, okay, so, you know, three, one, you know, these, there, there was were three clues and the answer was this. And um, they're trying to break the code. They're trying to basically when somebody and it's you can't do it on the first time, really. But in in future rounds, you keep the same four words and each you just take turns on your team, giving clues, giving clues, giving clues. And you're the other team is listening and they're like, OK, you know, they said uh, they said wood for the first one and they said bat in the second one. So maybe that's that's uh, maybe those are two different words that they're referring to or maybe they both mean the word ash. You know, because bats are made out of ash or something like that. So you have to try to come up with clues that are going to help your teammates get the right answer that right. Aren't, aren't super obscure that they're going to miss it. But at the same time, not be so obvious that if, you know, if it's tree is one of your words, you don't want to say elm and then birch and then whatever, because then the other going to say, oh, yeah, those are all trees. And so we know what that category is. Now, is it different enough from code words to to not? Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 It's got a very, very different feel to it. Um, okay. so, uh, it's, and it's, it's so highly recommended. So basically if your team messes up guessing one of your clues or if the other team breaks your code and, and guesses what your code numbers actually are, um, then, uh, then that's, that's how you win the game. So it plays really quickly. It's again, really easy to explain and and a lot of fun for, for social groups. Cool. That sounds like fun. Yeah. See, look at that. You got four new ones, Jeff. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Four I haven't seen. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 It's actually kind of intimidating. It is very intimidating. Uh, I think, and I still feel like this is only a small sample. You just didn't want yeah, to make us feel bad. I feel, feel like bad. he just doesn't want to make us feel bad. Exactly. I do too. Yeah. Craig, what about you, sir? 
You have a long list there. Uh, well, the, I'm just going to zip through the list because most of this is from that lost episode. I just want everybody to be aware of what I'm playing in case I have mentioned it last episode or you know, whatever. Uh, not so fast. We've been talking about that, of course, from um, yeah. from Smirk and Dagger, or I think it's Smirk and Laughter for Not So Fast. That's a blast. Um, fun uh, knee-jerk reaction game. Firefly Adventures I played with um, Russ's brother, John, and our friends, Joe and Pete quite a while ago again had a blast played with the real rules where you don't get to pick any piece of equipment you want you have to draft for the equipment that really added a lot to the gameplay uh played drop fleet commander which unfortunately we already spoke about what happened to that review which will come again in the future uh played that with pete and joe because uh john was tired and needed to go home because the wakeland mm-hmm. boys are generally uh early 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 risers and uh they're like babies when they have to go to down and take a nap. Early bedtime. Get your beauty yeah. rest, Craig. Come on. Exactly. Uh, well, obviously, I haven't been getting my. Uh, <laughs> I had a big game of 40K with uh, our local, uh, really, really A plus player, Matt, who was playing with the new Harlequins uh, before their codex came out. He's one of the hosts of the. Um, of uh, 40K radio. So they get all those codexes and everything early. So he was play testing basically the codex and uh, had a great game with him. That was a lot of fun. I, I basically was losing the whole game, but then got a really a couple of really good mission cards at the end and was able to pull it out by a couple points. So that was a blast. Uh, Colt Express came out with Senior Skip Day, which of course is that day where all of the seniors suddenly disappear. And I had a class that had all but three seniors. So those three kids were like, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I have this game called Colt Express. So that was fun. And then um, uh, more recently, which is uh, the, where Russ and I are going to almost entirely overlap at this point, uh, we, we we just recorded what we are uh, – uh, I, I think it, it might be a working title. I don't know, but we're calling them D61 pips. Right? We're single pips. Single pips. We haven't yes. – narrowed it down yet we're 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 we're, uh, we're experimenting with names here jeff exactly. it's sort of a uh, okay an evolution sure program. sure yeah 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 we're, we're letting uh, everybody see how the sausage is made basically well you don't want the name to come out too good in the beginning you nope. kind of want to evolve it a little bit you oh, know, okay. kind of mr mr marketing and uh, <laughs> yeah right i mean, you don't want to overwhelm the listeners managing. With... he's product managing as we want well, it's important. like our mvp of product names that we'll iterate on as we go forward oh jeez Right. All right. Uh, so anyway, we just did record uh, a very lengthy description of a huge, massive Warhammer 40,000 battle that we played over the weekend. Uh, in- That's already live by the time you hear this. Oh, the, yeah. So you've already heard it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we, so we're, we're just coming off of that weekend, actually, just three days ago. So we yes. played that. That's a big achievement. And uh, we played a top secret mission game. Uh, that was a big achievement. And we played a card game, which generally I don't really enjoy, but this was kind of fun. Red 7. Mm-hmm. Right? Red 7 was Yeah, Red 7 fun. Yeah. yeah, that was a fun game. Yeah. I enjoyed it. So uh, we played that. We played Rampage, which is fun. Um, mm-hmm. It was actually a blast when uh, Hank busted it out because he was all excited because he had one of the original uh, mm-hmm. Rampage titles. So you did not, uh, get, you not play Terror in Meeple City? No, we were No, we played the original Jack. <laughs> we did not bust out Terror <laughs> It's right up there with Shogun. You want to keep You're talking about naming too. things and you know naming is not not yes. not achieving your goal in renaming something, right. but whatever. ready ready to be sued. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. And so yeah. uh, so that was me and Russ. Do you want to care to elaborate at all on any of those? Well, yeah. So we got to play. Um, we have to thank Hank. So uh, Hank is one of the uh, the guys behind Adepticon, right? And so we were out visiting uh, in Peoria, Illinois, and Frank uh, Hank was kind enough to open his home to us. Uh, let us into his man cave, which is most impressive, Jeff. He has he literally has three 3D printers running at a time in there, yeah. cranking out terrain year round wow. for Adepticon. It was really impressive, uh, actually. Um, and but he also has uh, plenty of gaming couches and gaming table space whilst the 3D printers are going to play games. It's in so, a giant two car garage. That's not yeah, it's it's awesome. Gaming. Uh, Convention. unattached so you can be as noisy as you want yeah. not uh not impact the rest of the family in the house yeah. um, and so he was kind enough to, to open up his game collection for us and that's where we played red seven a few times uh and also um rampage uh which was good fun also yeah. so yeah that was that was fun yeah. absolutely uh what about modeling russ why don't you go first with mod- well you skip my i do have oh, one other thing to add yeah, to ahead. my gaming oh, sorry here. sorry uh in addition to all that, um, also lost in the annals of time was that I did play another session of my D&D campaign with my girls um, in which 
This episode, they invented Orca submersibles, which was pretty impressive. Uh, I had not seen that done before in D&D, where they polymorphed him into a whale, I mean, into an orca, a killer whale, at which point my druid said, oh, look at that. I can be a killer whale, too. Now I've seen one. Uh, and then they managed to get half the party stuffed in their mouths and swim for a while. It was, it was pretty hairy. And they managed to pass all their gag reflex tests, too, which was, which was good. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so that was a pretty neat. That's, an, uh, that's a creative <laughs> DM right there. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, you got it. I'm, I'm, you know, I have to thank Ross Watson. I was going to say, that is the epitome of the Ross Watson never say no theory. Ross, <laughs> Ross always said never say no when players try to do something. Just say yes and. Okay, but. <laughs> right. Okay, but. So it's like, okay, okay but you got to make but. a bad test. Gonna make a gag gesture. And they're in frigid Arctic waters in the Sea of Ice, you know. And I and I love the uh, exhaustion system in D and D five E. How it works is brilliant. So if they, you know, if the whale gagged a little bit, the water rushes in, and they and they're making exhaustion tests. And it was it was pretty neat. Um. So uh. So anyway, so that was fun. But also, one of the game I I haven't had a chance to play this yet, Jeff. But I picked it up. I couldn't resist. Um. Have you tried uh Rock Paper Wizard? I have. You you are in for a treat. <laughs> I looked awesome. So, so my uh, my kids obviously D and D fans were going camping again with the, with the, with the family. Also, along with my niece and nephew, also D and D fans. Um, and while we were in Peoria, um, we were introduced to this great gaming store that had a large collection of games. And there it was on a shelf: Rock Paper Wizard, mm-hmm. which, as Jeff knows, essentially um, it's a game where uh, cards are laid out st- face up, and they have different hand gestures. And then the table basically goes one, two, three, shoot. Uh, and instead of putting out the classic rock, paper, scissors gestures, uh, the four cards or four, four or five cards based on player count laid out in front of you show different gestures you can form your hands into. Uh, and by making those gestures and pointing them at another player, you're essentially different gestures mean like fireball or misty step or arcane shield or whatever. Uh, and then on the table, there's a small board with all your wizard tokens. Uh, and you're trying to get closer to the dragon's treasure to get more gold coins. And as you do these different spells, you're pushing wizards closer or farther away from this objective. And the first player to get the most loot uh, is the winner. Uh, and so it's a uh, really, I like the mechanics. I like the components. I haven't had a chance to get it to the table yet, but I'm really looking forward to this one. It seems like silly fun. And if you've got a crew of D&D guys, it seems like it'd be a no-brainer. Yep, yep. Those by the same guys that brought you junk art, if you played that one. That's the same designers. Yes, that's also a great game, too. So I, I was, I knew I was in pretty safe hands, but I, I wanted to try it out. Uh so what about modeling, Jeff? Have you done any uh, painting, you know, construction, board game management? <laughs> storage, you know, well, I do. I still, you know, a lot of prototyping in the in the games. You know, that's a cutting out of cards and stuff like that. So I certainly do yeah. a lot of that. Um, but counts. actually, my my uh, my daughter and um, uh, former D six G third chair Sydney, yes, uh, yes, just graduated from college and it's not uh, former Jeff. It's once you're a third chair, that's always a third always chair. a third chair. She's an alumnus, co third chair. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. College. <laughs> yes, she graduated. I know what I know. happened there. She just went to college. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I, yeah, she got out in three months. They gave her the degree. Oh my God. Just... <laughs> wow. They're, they're like, oh, wait, wait, Engelstein? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They Sign they here. charged me for four years. So I don't know. So oh, something oh, weird happened there. They get you coming and going, Jeff. That's how it works. Uh, but she and um, my wife, Susan, uh, went off after she graduated. They took a little mother daughter trip. Um, mm-hmm. uh, off to off to Europe uh, to have some fun there, and nice. uh, while they were away, I I built a shoe closet for my wife. I think uh, that wait, I will allow it. You will allow Whoa. the shoe closet. I I don't know about this. Now, wait, let me let me walk through, let me <laughs> walk this back. Well, they're they're miniature just, shoes, so I don't know. Maybe let me let me just double check what happened here, Jeff. <laughs> let me just get, your wife and daughter. Yes, went off on a trip for themselves to Europe. Yes, right. Whilst they're gone. Yes. Right. You were expected, asked, or did you surprise your wife by spending all that time building a closet for her? Asked. Okay. The closet okay. was asked. requested. Oh, wow. So whilst <laughs> I'm going to work without you, husband, yeah. please build a shoe closet. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. You know, Mother's Day is coming okay. up. I'd like a shoe closet. All right. Sure. I'm not. So, I, I am not going to let you savage Jeff. <laughs> I'm not, no, no. I would, not letting I'm just caboose savage our in, in that exact same scenario, I would do the exact same thing. <laughs> there, there is no other option for you. I'm not saying there's another option. Okay. I'm just pointing out what happened for the listeners at home. Yes, okay. exactly. That is that is a reasonable facsimile of what happened. So right. yes. <laughs> All right. Well, well, I, I was nice by myself for a week and a half, so uh, that that was just a small part of it. So I did get a lot of gaming in and stuff while oh, that's away. Good. So. 
Yeah. Right. So it was more like, since you get to game and do whatever the heck you want for two weeks, could I have a shoe closet it, upon my Pretty much, yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's a, <laughs> that's a well-played card by your wife. That's, I give her there's, there's a way that's to spend it. I allow it. <laughs> yeah, I allow it. I allow it. Yep. Um, so was it a nice shoe closet? You know, is it is this something you can look at and go, wow, that is an impressive bit of shoe closet construction? Yes, absolutely. It is a top-notch shoe closet. Now, do you remember there was an old <laughs> – I don't know why I'm going here, but there was an old – uh uh home improvement episode with tim allen where he built a shoe closet for his wife and it had like rotating shoes and automated drawers that came out with lighting yeah no sadly no, no? didn't didn't quite get to that level that, that'll be my my next le- you know that's you gotta start somewhere you know and then you build, you build from there. you gotta leave them alone for a month to get <laughs> now, my other, other question too because i'm a little so i'm concerned about this episode because my wife does occasionally listen oh, she yeah. has a lot of shoes and does not have a shoe closet so so I'm a little concerned here, honestly, Jeff. And what I need from you here is some kind of indicator of how many shoes. What is the rule for how many shoes, pairs of shoes one needs before a shoe closet becomes mandatory? Like, for example, if we're below a certain number, am I safe to say <laughs> you have not hit critical mass for needing a shoe closet? Um, well, I, I will say that the, uh, the the shoe closet that I built was built for uh, 60 pairs of shoes. Okay. So, I feel like I'm so there's your benchmark. Okay, good, good. So 59, don't need a closet. Right. 61, you do. Yes, right? exactly. 60, you're on the line. Okay, all right, all right. Now, is, is the shoe closet full today, or was, do you have room for growth? No, do you have no room for there's, all there's, there's, there's expansion space. Okay, good, you know. excellent. Well played, sir. Yes. And did Broken Token give you all the components? Or did you have to go <laughs> make this yourself? No, no, no. This is, this is a little bit more, you know, a little bit more harder than that. I'm glad that I've successfully managed to derail this show. This is this is really my <laughs> no, objective. That's excellent. I'm learning things every day, Jeff. Every day. Well, I, learn I will something. tell you that, the, that, I was, that I was super excited that I really got to use my impact driver. And, and, Ooh, and if, anybody, if anybody out there ever does anything like this, you, you must own an impact driver. It has changed my oh, life. Yeah, I have an impact driver. I look for projects <laughs> that are excuses to buy power tools. I do do that. So it sounds like you're in the same area. Sure. That was the real question. How many tools did you get to buy for this project? And that makes it worth it. Yes. <laughs> uh, Craig, what about, your, what about yourself? What about me? What? Can you top a shoe closet, Craig? I cannot. I cannot. Sadly. <laughs> his mini- I have- his, all his miniatures are unshod. It's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> the cobbler has no shoes, Jeff. <laughs> That's than nothing. Yeah, I got nothing. Um, uh, in the last episode, I did talk about finishing the drop fleet. Uh, the post-human Republic fleet is done. Yeah. And I was doing a full court press to try to finish the Scourge fleet. So I would have fleet finished. And then I fell into Star Wars Legion. And as referred to earlier in the last episode, I've been working really hard on that. Right now, I'm focusing primarily on the Rebels to try to get them all done because they're all different. And I'm hoping the Stormtroopers are going to be a lot easier because they're all just black and white. <laughs> yeah. Well, how hard can that be? And I, I, do, I do feel guilty about leaving the Scourge behind. But. Uh, I have one fleet for Drop Fleet, and the Star Wars minis are really, really cool looking. So what about you, Ross? Well, I have my new favorite thing, Jeff. Now, this is very, very dangerous, and it is super expensive. Okay. So uh, a couple episodes ago. Is it a radio? It's a radio saw, right? Is that what it is? No, no, no. (laughs) No, I have one of those, and they are dangerous and expensive, but no. Um, So um, a couple episodes ago, I was talking about how I was trying to find a really cool gnome figure for my brother's D and D campaign. And, uh, as bemoaning the fact that it's really hard to find cool gnomes. Um, and I was talking to Sean from relic blade and he has a whole gnome faction where we were together commiserating on how it's hard to find great gnomes. And one of our listeners <laughs> said, Hey, have you checked out, have you checked out heroforge.com? Okay. And this website is dangerous. So if you go to heroforge.com, what you need to, so listeners, imagine if you will, you're playing a role-playing game like a a computer-based role-playing game, like pick one, Skyrim, you know, Dragon Age, whatever, and you're creating your hero, and you create their face, their body type, their gender, their, you know, their race, whether they're an elf, a dark elf, you adjust their ear length, their expression, you would pick their equipment, what's on their belt, what's on their backpack, and then imagine you could press a button, and the person you just created gets mailed to you in a box as a 28-millimeter figure. That's what Hero Forge is, and it is awesome. 
So you can go create the exact character you want. You can create a mounted. You can create them on foot. You can make them a cat person. You can make a 40K general. You can make just about any D&D character you can imagine. The downside to this brilliant thing is that they are for the high quality plastic, for board game quality plastics, like rubbery plastics, it's about $20 a figure. Uh, for high quality, harder plastics, which is the kind you expect from like, uh, not quite Games Workshop level, but it's in the zone, uh, $30 a big miniature. And then you can go crazy and get them in pewter or bronze and all kinds of stuff, but don't do that. Um, but so it's a little pricey. But if you have your own 3D printer for like, I think it's like four bucks, you can download the data files to print them yourself. Um, so this is a really cool service. I ordered, my brother ordered a bunch. I ordered a couple. I ordered my cool gnome. I also ordered a couple of the villains that are in the campaign I'm running. They are beautiful. I'm really happy with them. They're a little less detailed than some of the miniatures you might expect, but they still look fantastic. And I love that you can pose them. You can have them casting spells. You can even design the bases and you can have your character's name printed on the bottom of the base. They're really cool. So check it out. If you were interested, if you've been looking for that hard to find miniature that you just can't find the exact pose or equipment on, check out heroforge.com. Really cool. Uh, also, I will say, when Craig and I went to Pure, I had another successful transport of all my models in my Battle Foam uh, Pack 720. I put I had an entire Pure Guard army in there, and I checked the bag, and they all got there with no damage. Yep. Like, so I have to say, um, still, that, and that's fantastic. Because how else do you transport these armies? You just can't. Right. I had an entire massive space wolf army that I did the same thing with. Although I did put mine in a hard case suitcase, just because I didn't want to have multiple suitcases. I just checked mine and let it go. I know you did, and that's fine. That's great. I said mine also worked, and it was inside a suitcase, so I didn't have to worry about checking multiple bags. So I- it was brilliant. Yep. What about other stuff? Geeky goodness, Jeff. What about the uh, movies, books, TV shows? What have you been doing there? Um, well, I just finished a book uh, called We Are Legion, which was book one of the Bobaverse series, which somebody mentioned on Twitter, and I thought I'd check it out about a von Neumann probe that gets an AI, an old brain that this guy was frozen, cryogenically frozen, and they shoved his brain into a probe and sent it out into space. So was it kind of like V'ger? V'ger backwards? <laughs> I suppose. Um, but it was, it was fun. It was cute. Um, I, I may go on and read the next one. I think there's like four of them out right now. Certainly a quick breezy yeah. read. That's very familiar. Yeah, I, I think it's only a couple of years old, but um, you know, it was just a couple of bucks as a Kindle download. Um, and um, I also went back in um, a couple of months ago, finally finished the Octavia Butler Patternist series. Um, which is four books back from the seventies and eighties, I believe. Um, and, uh, uh, it uh, really, really, the first book was amazing called wild seed, um, which was actually, I think one of the last ones she wrote, she wrote, they weren't, uh, you, you're supposed to read them chronologically in the order of the, the universe, but you, uh, they were actually, uh, written in a different order, but, um, that, and it's interesting cause you know, she's writ- wrote them over a span of many, many, many years. And you can see for the ones she wrote later, the quality of her craft is so much better. It's really interesting, but definitely worthwhile reading that. Um, awesome. And, uh, on the movie side, we, we last week saw Incredibles too, which I really enjoyed. It was fun. It was cute. Yeah. Didn't like it as much yeah. as one of the guys we were with. It was like claimed it the best movie he's seen in 10 years, but, Okay. Oh, fine. wow. <laughs> I, love that. It was, I liked it a lot. Yeah, I know. I was like, okay, well, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, my daughter's ranked it as one of the better Disney sequels up there with like Toy Story 2. Yes. And I really liked the Portal Girl. That was, she was good. Yeah, she was awesome. Uh, uh, and I was recently, as I mentioned, I went out to um, uh, Salt Lake uh, City for the Tabletop Network conference. And on the flight out there, I saw um, uh, Coco, uh, which I hadn't great? seen before. And I'll have to say, I teared up a little bit. I was going to say, you can't make it through that movie without a little bit of tear. <laughs> yes. Man, it's not possible. My son called it like a, the, the guided missile of emotional uh, manipulation. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Uh, it does, it does. Uh, but while I was out there, I also ended up in Vegas um, uh, for a trade show. I went from Salt Lake City, and um, I, I had a chance to try um, uh, this VR experience that they have out there now called The Void. Uh, uh, it's from the company called The Void. It's Star Wars VR. So it's a free roaming VR, um, similar to um, the one I, the same company that did the Ghostbusters one that's in New York City. Um, but this one, you actually um, are a rebel trying to, uh, you're disguised as a stormtrooper trying to infiltrate uh, and steal something. I don't even remember the plot, but it was pretty cool. Um, so you just, you know, you just have a big backpack 
um, and, and and the goggles. You can just run free through the through the, the area, and there's a whole different scenes that you go through and it was very immersive and really cool um some of the stuff is still a little janky in terms of the figures and the way that people move and things like that um and you get shot a lot and it doesn't matter uh (laughs) so there's no like no score or anything at the end uh but it was fun um and you know really been getting into some vr stuff i have a vr set up at home and uh the 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 thing that i've been loving with vr is this game beat saber yeah, I can't wait to try this. So I have. I a think PS- it's out on PSVR now or coming out soon. Not, not yet soon. I can't wait. I have PSVR. I don't have anything. I don't have a huge uh, Oculus rig or anything. Yeah. But I do have PSVR, and I do like what's available on it. Um, and I wish there was a little. And, and Beat Saber looks awesome, Jeff. So this is the one that's like Star Wars meets Dance Central. Exactly. You have. Uh, you basically have a lightsaber in each hand, and these cubes are coming at you, red and blue cubes. You have to slice them with the right saber at, on the beat as it comes towards you, and there's an arrow on it that shows you the direction you got to hit it. And I now have this as part of my exercise rotation in the morning. I'll do like three yeah. or four songs before I go to work. It is really very intense. In these walls, there's walls and that you have to duck under or duck around and jump around. It's if, if you have the opportunity to try Beat Saber, it is highly recommended. I've got a lot of nice. Oculus games, and it's one of the best. It's right up there. Now, does this, do you actually find yourself working up a little sweat? Like oh, yeah. Oh, workout? yeah. Oh, cool. Especially, like, through Fire and Flames. It's very scary. My my goal nice. in life, though, is to be Take On Me from AHA. Uh-huh. That's, for some reason, that <laughs> song Dan is Central, like the death so, of me. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Central is the same way. Dan Central could kill you. Yes. That, that's a tough game, yeah. <laughs> Um, yep. And I've also been playing a lot of Heroes of the Storm lately. Um, that's the Blizzard MOBA game. Um, yeah, Rafe's on there too, so say hi to Rafe. Oh, is he really? I should friend him. We actually, uh, which I'm really interested to, to try. So we just registered and the new season starts at the beginning of August. So we've got a, a bunch of people together um, and you can, it's like a league. It's like an amateur league where you actually play with the same people all the time. And, you know, you, you set up matches and you, 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 know, you draft, it's just like a professional thing. You can draft, you can trade characters, you know, you, you train together, you just so you play with the same people for the whole uh, league, like a round robin thing. Um, so we have our team, uh, Lucio Dology, um, because I like playing Lucio, and we just, they were all Ludology fans, but that's our team name. And so I'm really looking forward to trying that and trying a, a video game in a real organized competitive environment rather than just with randoms that you get matched up with, which can sometimes be a great experience, but a lot of times can be really frustrating, especially in a team game. Nice. Um, and then on TV, we just finished up Westworld, uh-huh. which maybe I understood. I'm not sure. I think I understand. We're about halfway through the finale. So okay, I'm not going to say anything then, so I'll just yeah, leave it at no that. Spoilers. Uh, but I, quite a few episodes I, left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I was talking to Craig about this, Jeff. I think like, the first season, the big twist was, hey, the timeline's not what you think it is, right? And then the second season, they kind of go all in on the whole timeline being wacky thing. Um, and it t- you have to start really watching, like, okay, oh, his shirt's different there. Or he's got the wound. He doesn't have the wound. Like, yeah. um to follow it, and I think I like that, but it also feels like it's work. <laughs> it is. It is pretty much work. When we finish an episode, Susan spends like the next two hours, like going through all of the recaps and the theories and whatnot. Right. But that's part of the fun for her. So yeah, yeah it's like it's like it's almost like a, a Sudoku puzzle. You're like, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> let, me, let me get this. Uh, but I like it. Yeah, I like it. so that's good. So you'll enjoy the rest of the finale on that. Um, right. and, uh, there is an after credit scene. I will tell you that. So don't okay. stick around through the credits. Uh, okay. uh, we've been watching handmaid's tale, which is just such a well done show, but incredibly depressing to watch. Uh, and on my daughter's recommendation, I've started watching gravity falls, the old Disney cartoon. Yeah. And I'm up to season two on that. So that's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. been it for me. Nice. Craig, what about you, sir? Uh, well, I just wanted on record that uh, I finished the Powder Mage series and was very satisfied with it. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed it right through to the end. Uh, I finished the Great Martian War series by Scott Washburn, narrated by mm-hmm. Rowan Rain Greenlee, um, and I really enjoyed that. And I am now listening to, I think it's The Witcher Book 6, Lady of the mm-hmm. Lake. And uh, I just spoke of that last episode, so I'm still listening to that, enjoying it. Uh, TV shows... Westworld. I'm having a very hard time logging into our HBO account for some reason. So every time I get a moment, uh, which I don't get very often where I get to watch my own shows, I'm all excited and then I can't watch HBO. So I'm behind on Westworld. 
Uh, Handmaid's Tale is Karen's favorite show on TV right now. Uh, despite the fact that she sobs incessantly the entire time we're watching it. <laughs> so that's a little unnerving, but at least there's a show we can enjoy, if that's the right word, together. Uh, still watching Arrested Development, trying to finish up season five, uh, getting ready for season five. I thought the Lost in Space ending was great. I loved that whole season. Uh, and I watched all of Cobra Kai, which I talked about at great length in the episode that was lost. But if you're a fan of uh, Karate Kid, you need to go watch Cobra Kai on uh, YouTube Red. You can get it for free for a month. You can watch. Um, and then The Abyss. Uh, uh, well, my big, my big exciting moment was realizing that I still had one episode of Timeless to watch. So that was exciting. And The Abyss, I've gone back because halfway through this season, The Abyss switches to uh, the next novel, which is really exciting and really, really good. And uh, movie. But the funny thing about the last episode was that the two movies that I watched were Deadpool 2 and Solo. And since then, I have watched each of those again once. So there you go. it was Deadpool 2 and Solo, and now it's Deadpool 2 times 2 and Solo times 2. And I enjoyed them both immensely. Russ, how about yourself? Uh, great. Well, um, yeah, I, uh, so first of all, for books, um, I just finished the second book of the Powder Mage series. And so feeling good about that. I really enjoyed it. Looking forward to book three. I'm into that now. Um, for TV shows, uh, as I mentioned, I'm getting to the end of Westworld. I finished Timeless also. Craig, I wasn't impressed with the ending as much as you were, unfortunately. So, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were, I don't know. I think my daughter's really out of that one. So that's kind of hard. Uh, I think it the, might have poisoned her. Yeah, a little bit. And then uh, Voltron. So, if you're watching Voltron on Netflix, Jeff, have you seen this show on Netflix? I have not. Okay. So, Voltron on Netflix is now, especially after season six, my second favorite animated TV show of all times, right after Avatar The Last Airbender. Really? It is really, really good. Uh, They do a really good job of serious episode, serious episode, stupid, silly side episode, serious episode, serious episode, which is the same thing Avatar did. Um, And what's really good about it, I mean, the animation style this season, they went nuts with it. But particularly good, episode three of season six, uh, they do a, an homage. Well, let's just say for some reason that's unexplained, the entire cast of Voltron is playing Monsters and Mana, which is essentially Dungeons and Dragons. And it is great. It is awesome. They have every D&D trope in there. It's hilarious. Uh, but anyway, really loving Voltron. Also, for quirky shows... The Hollow on Netflix, another great animated series, um, really bizarre. Like, um, I don't know, it's really good. My daughters and I are enjoying that too. So these are shows that my teenage daughters now, 14 and 15, are really enjoying watching with me. And then on deck is Luke Cage. I can't wait to watch. Have you started watching Luke Cage yet, Craig? I tried, but I came home from Peoria exhausted uh, went oh, for a yeah. run uh, despite all of those steps that we got in the airports coming and going. And really wiped myself out. I just fell asleep. Uh, and that's no comment on uh, Nick Cage. It's just, I was just completely exhausted. And I only get so I nights a week. So I, I, yeah, I haven't started it yet. But that's on my list. Now, Jeff, I have a video game for you, sir. Okay. So you have a, you have a PlayStation, right? I do not. Sorry. Oh, well, well you got to no, find someone. Yes, my son has one. I, thought you I do have access to a PlayStation, yes. Yes. You need to play the video game Detroit Being Human, Becoming Human. Okay. Uh, This game is art on the highest level. Uh, It is full of amazing social commentary that I think you will particularly appreciate. Um, But also, it is a fantastic storytelling methodology um, and really, really one of the most amazing video game experiences I've ever had. Hmm. Detroit being human. So here's how this game is. It's a, uh, it's kind of like video games meet make your own adventure. So it's not like a first-person shooter. There's really no combat. Um, What little combat there is is really more like uh, button timing. Like, you know, you you hit the A button right here to to jump over the fence, or you can hit the B button to to dodge to the right. But it's almost like those timer events you get in Tomb Raider, like that kind of thing. Um, But it's really about the moral decisions you have to make, and the game is told through the perspective of three different characters who all happen to be androids, 
And what's happening throughout the story is takes place in Detroit, Michigan. And what happens throughout the story is you are um, the androids are 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 becoming sentient. And so how do you deal with this story? Um, and how do you, the android, react to that? Uh, fantastic storytelling, great plot, a lot of interesting social commentary and amazing, amazing graphics. And what was really cool about it was the the web of options you have at the end of each level are shown, but grayed out so you can't read them what the other things you could have done were. And my oldest daughter played the game through first. It takes about 10 hours to do a playthrough. And she insisted that her sister play it again, and she watched the entire time to see what she did. So my younger daughter played it through the entire time of my older daughter watching. She made it, got it to the end, made a couple of mistakes. She wanted to see different results. So she played it through a second time. And then they gave it to me and they insisted they both watch me play the game entirely again. I don't know of too many video games where you want to watch someone else play it hmm. through again. Um, really interesting. I, ha- I highly recommend this game. Got to check it out. I will definitely do that. That's a great recommendation. And then last, last, Jeff, this is for you a little bit. This is kind of my work life getting into my gaming life. But I thought <laughs> since you present a lot and since you um, do a lot of these uh, game theory shows and everything or these, these conferences, have you, are you familiar with the Picha Kucha format? presentations i am not i am not either when i first heard about it i thought it was a new pokemon but actually (laughs) what it is is so i was invited to speak at a local uh product management group up here in new england and um and and i had done this other this topic once before and it usually takes me about an hour and they're like can you come present i'm like sure i'd be happy to and they said great so it's the picha kucha format i said what does that mean well they got you got seven minutes I'm like, seven minutes, okay. You know, TED Talks, 15 minutes, seven minutes, okay. It's a half a TED Talk, all right. He goes, but yeah, but you might want to Google it and see what the real... So what it is is, Jeff, you have... You're supposed to have exactly 20 slides, and each slide is shown for exactly 20 seconds. Right? Okay. And so it's really six minutes and 40 seconds to present your topic. And so I've I've hacked the format slightly, where I do have exactly 20 slides, but some of the slides only have minor differences. So it's more like doing a build, you know, in PowerPoint, but instead it's like, right. you know, the next slide just shows in 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. But it's been very challenging to try to get succinct in six minutes, 40 seconds, any kind of useful information. Uh, so I found it fascinating and I found my gamery self really thinking through the way I play games as I try to get this information into a succinct format. So I thought it might be kind of a neat way to uh, present game designs, right? Imagine if you were doing a game design review like a Shark Tank situation. I thought you tweeted about that. And each designer had only seven, six minutes and 40 seconds with 20 slides to present it. Yeah. That could be pretty clear. No, that's, that's, uh, that sounds interesting. And and yeah, when you, when you kind of have those constraints, it really forces you to focus your message. You know, I've kind of been living with that for many years with um, game tech uh, on the dice tower where it's, it needs to be, it can't be more than five minutes. You know, Tom sends it back. Right. If it's five Oh three, he's like, no, take that three seconds. <laughs> um, so, you know, to, to take some of the topics I'm doing, it, it really forces you to sit in and, and know exactly what you want to say and what's going to be important and how you're going to tie it all together. So I, I appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, I always tell people it takes me just as long to do that five minute piece for the Dice Towers. It does do an hour long episode of Ludology. It's the same. Well, same that's the funny time. part. Exactly. People always said, like, for the D6G, why don't you just make it shorter if it's too much work? I'm like, I don't think it gets to be less work when you make it shorter. <laughs> it's, that's it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, it's hard. And now, in an attempt to bring a small amount of dignity and decorum to this otherwise base form of entertainment, and I use the term loosely, I am proud to present... Oh, get on with it. It's time for App of the Up. Seriously, Wakeland, I used to have my own segment, and now I'm relegating to announcing this pap... Hey, you're lucky we still use you. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another App of the Up. This time around, uh, another one a little bigger than an app. It is... Warhammer 40,000 Gladys Relics of War. (laughs) Um, I couldn't help be attracted to this uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it is Warhammer 40,000 video games, so those always uh, get my attention. Uh, Two, um, it is a 4X uh, attempt at Warhammer 40,000. And upon watching a few videos, this looked like some, it looks like the love child of sort of civilization, you know, Civilization 5, Civ 6, and Warhammer 40,000 which is something I have a hard saying no to. So I went ahead and dove in and acquired it and played it through uh, the demo or sorry, the tutorial along with a very short campaign 
uh, and thought I'd share my thoughts. Um, uh, first of all, the game is beautiful, looks great. Um, and it's clear that this is definitely a love letter to the Warhammer 40,000 community. Uh, lots of great art, uh, all the models in the game lovingly rendered. Um, it's fantastic. And so if you're a 40 K fan, um, you're going to have a hard time saying no to this. And this game's brand new, by the way, it just came out. It's on steam, uh, PC only steam. And it just came out this month in July here. Um, one of the things that also attracted me to it was that there's four playable factions. You can choose between uh, the Orcs, the Imperial Guard, Necrons, or Space Marines. Um, so already I like the different factions. That's already a nice spin on um, on uh, Civilization because in Civilization, um, while there are different leader types you can choose from, they really only have mild differences you know, there may be one or two special units, uh, per civilization you can build. And there's some kind of bonus, uh, you know, to something, but these obviously all look different, different unit types, but there's also vastly different abilities. Um, now the biggest thing here, you're going to notice uh, if you're a Civ fan and a 4X fan, uh, there's definitely a 4X going on here. There's definitely exploring. There's tons of extermination. It is 40,000. Uh, there's definitely exploiting the land, harvesting resources. That's all there. Um, and of course, but what's missing here a little bit is this, the diplomacy and culture. So unlike civilization, there's no real culture, there's no real religion, and there's no real diplomacy, you know, turning your AI or your friends, um, against each other. Uh, but that makes a lot of sense because let's be honest, we're in the grim darkness of the far future and there is only war. Uh, so they did a good job there, but they did do a neat trick to make the game not just about uh, wipeout victory. So there are actually two ways to win Gladys when you play it in both the single player campaign as well as the multiplayer campaign. You can either exterminate, wipe out all your other opponents, or you can complete the storyline for your faction. And I haven't played enough to know if these are always different for each faction or not. I mean, I know they're different for each faction, but what I don't know is are they... Um, are they uh, different each time you play the orcs? In other words, as you play the game, there are little chapters that unfold, little mini objectives to do. It might be get a weird boy to go over and explore this particular uh, arcane site, or it might be go and defeat three enemies in battle, or it might be collect a certain amount of this kind of resource or whatever. And there's different ones that happen. And they are different and they are story driven. There's a nice little narrative in there and they are different as you progress. So uh, it kind of is like, um, building a tech tree or solve or getting to Alpha Centauri and civilization, you're trying to get that one objective going on there. So that's a nice spin. So you can either fight or you can be defensive and try to do these sorts of things. Um, each of the factions feels exactly flavorful. Now, one thing that will be a little alien to a 40 K player is the, the combat system and the units work just like they do in civilization, meaning there's no stacking per hex. So you're going to have, if you're trying to run an army up of, you know, a bunch of orc boys, a few orc buggies, some death coptas, um, and a gargant, those are all going to be in different hexes and kind of working around. And the only way they're working together is you're moving them all sort of in a synergistic way. There's no like giant battlefield, uh, fighting thing. So it's very much like Civ in that way. Um, and at first I thought that would bother me, but, uh, it didn't, <laughs> I really enjoyed it actually. So, um, I'm really liking the game. Like I said, I played my first one. I'm going to try, um, going through the different factions, um, the Necrons and the Space Marines are, are say right up front, they're easier to play than the Guard and the Orcs for obvious reasons, just the resilience. Um, oh, one thing I did like about the game a lot is even though there's only four playable factions and you might think, wow, there's so much of the flavor of the 40K universe that's missing. Um, what's great about it is they've introduced it into the things you run into. So right in the very beginning, uh, instead of, you know, if you think about civilization, as soon as you start exploring the world, you're starting into barbarians and other sort of NPC races that are causing trouble here. I ran into crude hounds right off the bat. Uh, and so all the native species and other things are things that are from the 40 K universe in different ways. So even though a particular faction might not be playable, such as the crude or the Tau, they may show up as random encounters uh, on the map as well. So really, really, uh, great, um, I think um, it was great for 40K players. I think if you're a 40K player, uh, this is a no brainer. And you like 4X games, this is a no brainer. So for someone like me, it's right in your warehouse. Just drop everything and go buy it. However, if you're a Civ player uh, and you're like, well, it's another Civ game, and I, I but I don't care about 40K, I think the removal of some of the, th there's nothing innovative here. It's not like Dawn of War, where Dawn of War was really sort of a really fresh take on some RTS tropes when it came out. So in addition to it being a great imitation of 40K, it was also a really robust uh, real-time strategy game. I'm not sure there's anything really 
other than different playable factions, which is pretty interesting. I'm not sure there's enough new here. Uh, I mean, I think you're better off playing Stellaris or one of the other more in-depth, you know, RTSs. I mean, I'm sorry, 4X games, if that's your cup of tea. But if you're a 40K fan uh, and you're looking for a way to get your fix uh, while you're waiting for your new codex to come out, whatever, definitely take a look at a Warhammer 40,000 Gladys Relics of War on Steam right now. Thank you for listening to another scintillating edition of App of the App. A segment in which, hey, less of that, more just getting on with the show. Seriously, Wakelin, you are like school in summer. No class. Hey, welcome back. (laughs) You have no idea how far back we're welcoming you. That's right. Uh, so we have Terrace with us. And of course, it's always fun to catch up with Terrace and to hang out with Terrace. And actually at Adepticon, it was very funny. A little side story here. Uh, unfortunately, Russ can stop me at any time because he's got the technology. But I don't think he, I'm going to put right. I'm going to put this right out there, Russ. So, Terrace, we were, we were playing phone tag with Terrace on the night we all showed up at uh, Adepticon. And uh, then Terrace kind of kind of kind of snuck up, snuck one on us by saying, hey, why don't I just come to your room? What room number are you? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so I gave him our room number, at which point Russ said, oh, Craig, I'm naked. And by naked, he said, <laughs> you know, he was ready for bed. So I just said, well, st-, and, and he doesn't sleep naked. He uses that term loosely. He's a <laughs> dude. But anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, so Ru- I was like, well, Russ, just stay in bed and everything will be fine. So Terrace came and hung out with us till like one thirty in the morning. And Russ <laughs> just stayed in bed. Never, never got out of bed. Nope. So if I could recreate that hour and a half for you, my faithful <laughs> listeners, I would do that in a heartbeat. Mainly because there was always that vague discomfort in Russ's tone. <laughs> to get out of bed. So if anything dangerous had ever happened, he would have just been trapped there under That's the right. blanket. I would have been. But anyway, so uh, I, now is a great time to get <laughs> get back in touch with Terry. There's your, there's your I, I, alliterative name of the segment. I tried to uh, f- uh, feed him a whole bunch of water, but he didn't even accept the water for some reason. <laughs> true, that is true. And and occasionally he was making some strange fountain noises, too. To <laughs> go, but that didn't work. Wow, so, Paris! <laughs> Hello, how sir. have you been? Good, very excellent. Actually, yeah, very we're good. all yeah. thankful. We we just accidentally saw just a glimpse of Terrace on the uh, on the video chat. <laughs> yeah, right. Toggled this video off. Uh, Terrace is just coming back from a long weekend of camping, and uh, it yes. took its toll. I'll have to say, <laughs> <laughs> the dapper yeah. dapper surfer dude that you're used to seeing when you see Terrace. Right. That guy looks a little rough around the edges right now. <laughs> may, may have been attacked by a bear. We're not going to lie. It, looked a little- yeah, it was pretty much. Well, that, as a matter of fact, we did have a little scare on, on the campground. Uh, oh. um, my good friend, Brian Hicks, his wife uh, were was walking their dog or their friend's dog. And they came across a baby calf moose that had just been born and Ooh. the mother. Oh, and. That's never a good thing to come across. No, when you're, no, yeah, right, right, right. Baby, um, moms, mom mooses are very large and very protective. So, right. uh, yeah, they had to flag somebody down to uh, help them uh, drive past the moose. And yeah, it was a little scary for uh, for them. So, wow. Yeah, so wow. We did we did have some animal, some actual animal uh, uh, adventures. Now, nature. Did you ever- does that explain why your hair looks like you were pushing at the birth of the moose? No. <laughs> well, wow. it's pretty much, it, it is pretty much like that. Yes, I, I, it is the greasiest it's been in a long time. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I love to have – I love to be clean. I'm a very clean person. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Uh, but uh, when I camp, I don't. I am not clean. So uh, yes, you you saw my hair greasy, okay. my unshaven face. My as a matter of fact, I'm very glad that this is not. Uh, there's no uh, scratch and sniff D6 generation thing because because <laughs> uh, you would sm- you would yeah. smell terrace in his uh, most uh, smoke camps fire smoke yeah. sweat in person right. Right. Yeah, you wouldn't want that. Really, it's not a good thing to to pass to other people. Well, we're, we're glad you're back and safely recovered from uh, nature. So that's that's a good yes. thing. Yeah, yes. indeed. Yes. Terrence, we haven't we haven't spoke to you a little while. I do want to ask now because it feels like Geek Nation tours now. You know, is kind of uh, 
grown up. I think we talked about this the last time. Yeah. But it feels like it's even more grown up now. You have tours going on that you aren't even present for anymore, right? Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. So it, it, and now that 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 Geek Nation tours is kind of entering its 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 zenith, right? It's 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 giant state it's currently in. Like when you're not like invading my room at midnight or fighting off a baby <laughs> moose. Um, what what is a day in the life of Terrace kind of like? Oh, that's. Um... I get up and I try, I try to run every morning when I get up every mm-hmm. morning, uh, four times a week anyway. I, uh, uh, right after that, I hop in the chair of, of email chair and I start my emails yeah. and I frantically try to get through all my emails until there are no emails done and then I write tours. So Ooh. my day is uh, catching up on me- emails, which usually means talking to people about our partnerships, uh, answering client, of course, emails. But uh, mostly it, it's uh, logistical stuff like uh, uh, talking to a hotel or talking to a gaming company like Mantic or something like that about the partnerships that we have. And then uh, by the end, I find around Wednesday is when I can start normally uh, building tours. So the back end of the week is usually about til- tour building, and the front end of the week is just trying to catch up from the week from the weekend of uh, f- people filling my inbox, inbox. with emails. Right. Now, yeah. what's the, what is building a tour like? Like, how does that work? Well, there's a lot of things we do. Uh, uh, f- one thing we do is do a lot of research online about a destination. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we can go to a destination. Sometimes we can scout a destination. But uh, a lot of times we go in by just doing a whole bunch of research online. Uh, I couldn't do my job without the internet uh, and our present state of technology. Um we contact local guides to help us with uh, guiding tours. We talk to restauranteurs, whether they can handle a large group, uh, hotels. We do a lot of research into hotels because I've been caught a couple times about some of the hotels that I have trusted. You know, uh, the there's no real standard um, – there's no really standard rating system for hotels. Mm. Uh, you don't trust TripAdvisor? <laughs> well, a TripAdvisor, I do. I um but let's before we start start with TripAdvisor. Generally, hotels are ranked with themselves, and they're and a five star hotel, for instance, will get the fifth star if it has a desk in most rooms. Oh, uh, so it's so how a hotel rates itself is different than what a TripAdvisor would rate it. Mm-hmm. Now, TripAdvisor, what's good about TripAdvisor is that it has two ways of ra- ranking systems. You have the comments and the uh, people that have stayed there, mm-hmm. but then you have this bar, this graph at the very top that is just the math of how people rank it and that's how i start my research on whether there's a good hotel or not oh, because of the math of how people rank it that's- yes yeah so i don't i don't i don't look at the comments first yeah i look at just the graph and if they have a really high excellent rating oh right that's the- that's so it's the like the percentage of excellent versus the percentage of very good versus the percentage of average, right? So you're exactly. looking for like what is your best recommendation now? Is it like in the nineties, eighties? Like where do you think if you're in a you're in a ballpark of a quality hotel? Yeah, I I make it well. I try to find hotels that have a, a lot of people ranking it also oh, right. because yes. right. I mean that's that's really important too because if it's just mm-hmm. five people ranking it, then you, it doesn't the math doesn't work out right. But, right, right. But um, my my. And then, of course, TripAdvisor is also on a star system. So they have a five-star system. So I look for a five-star hotel mostly. Um, sometimes I'll look like for a good four-star, but I start to get worried about it after it's a lower than a four-star yeah. for my tours. Yeah. It's, it's different. Well, I've, I'm kind of used to – I'm kind of a big princess now. I'm, I, I'm, I'm used to staying at, at nice hotels, so I don't do that anymore. But if somebody was about to say, Terrace, work, I'm planning on going to Destination A – what about this hotel? And it was a three or four star. I would say, okay, you'd be really careful about the three star, but careful about the, the, the four star would probably, you know, do you good if you're looking at TripAdvisor. So four or five is what I've looked at trip, TripAdvisor. It's a good, good, good travel tip. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. The math is important. The math is the big deal. Is, yeah. Is, is, is a big one. I, I'm a big fan of TripAdvisor myself. Not that I plan tours, but when I do travel, I like, I like TripAdvisor. Um, yeah. So, so how is how has it changed? I mean, I know when you ran the whole thing, like now that Greek Nation Tours is kind of semi grown up, 
Like, what's the biggest change over the last few years from when you used to run it as sort of a one man show into now? Greek nation tours? Are you changing? Greek, yeah, yeah. Well, if you yeah. can go to Greek saw, nation tours, you can get a nice, uh, a nice. Uh, they're, they're, baklava. The Greece, they're, 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 <laughs> those guys, those guys are good. We like them. They're, they're. We're trying to work on a partnership. Actually, GNT. It's very confusing. That's right. That's right. That's right. Actually, you know what? We were. Uh, uh, we were hacked by a Greek liberation <laughs> army. <laughs> uh, Greek liberation <laughs> army guy. What are they trying to what? liberate from? What are they I, do, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I don't have no idea. I don't know anything politics about Viva the resistance. I know. I don't That's think they have their own problems, I'm sure. I mean, we all, every country has their own. That's true. Okay. That's true. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah, they, that is that, singularly. Our, our site went down, and I'm like, <laughs> um, guys. And then what? And then, <laughs> the sorry, we thought you were the Greek <laughs> nation. <laughs> that's, that's, oh. that's what it was. Oh, they, pa. Yeah, they're, they're laughing like Frenchmen now. Is that what it was? Uh, oh. It was. I don't know what Greek software pirates <laughs> sound like. It's very good. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, now you never know who's hacking you. Right, you, right. You could say it's one person, but it's I just really thought we'd figure it was the Russians for sure. But it, it probably was the Russians, right? Really. Right, right. right. Uh, yeah. Just pinging their address <laughs> around. Right, that's the right. The, 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 that's Grecian, right. the Grecian ruse, it's the classic. So I know that there's been some trouble down south, but the, the, uh, you guys weren't the only ones that got hacked by the Russians. It was right. it was it was us here. Tours, yeah. yeah. They were tours, in the Greeks. So yeah, yeah that's right. Exactly. Exactly. At this point, we may have been hacked by Greece. We're not sure ourselves. We don't know. We don't. We don't, we don't know. know. It, it, could it, farm, it could have been a hacker farm in Thessaloniki. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been, right? Uh, and they could have took a left at Albuquerque. Yeah, exactly. Oh, nice callback. Okay. All right. Back All right. Down. So, so well, Greek how hackers. Have vacation tours changed and grown. <laughs> how <laughs> are vacation tours? Well, they get hacked uh, by Greeks now, Craig. That's clearly the biggest problem. Now I know. Wow, we know we hit the big time. We <laughs> now I know why time. Russ yeah. tries to ignore me when I do that. Look what I did <laughs> to this whole interview. The whole thing derailed. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm yes. Like, we knew that day that we were big and 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 as <laughs> Russ said, matured. Yeah. So, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, anyways, yes. Uh, how have we changed? Well, uh, I do have. Uh, I have two uh, contract contracted guides. Uh, as you mentioned before, I have uh, uh, tours going on at the same time. When we were at Adepticon, for instance, I had my uh, anime tour happening in Japan. They went to the Tokyo Anime Festival and went to the Ghibli uh, uh, Studios and tons of other cool uh, anime stuff type stuff while i was at adepticon so that was that was an adventure for me that was the, really the first big one i think mm -hmm. i also have uh alex from ironheart artisans he takes care of uh, uh, gen con for me uh, he's done other tours for me so that one and then i have a marketing woman she works in uh new zealand so she does all my marketing for me uh, tour wise, we try to expand and figure out what we're doing. We really try to, to expand boundaries of, of what it, what a geek is. I, we're, I think I might have said this on your last time. I was, we're still working on our SETI tour, trying to get a tour to, uh, uh, the Allen Array and the Green Bank Radio Telescope. So we're, we're expanding into science too, is, is our hope. We are, um, our partnerships are become more and more important to us. So we've done a lot of partnering with various uh, companies. I've got a really big one, but I can't. I can't tell you the the, the partner that ship that we have with our uh, our miniature in the war. Uh, our sorry, our Seki Gahara tour. Of, it's, it's it's not quite there. I wish I could tell you, but I can't. Oh. Uh, that so we have a big one on that one. Like if you're interested in Japan. And battlefields, um, come and see us in about two months from Ooh. when this releases. Yeah, it's oh, really it's close. Intriguing. So it's a big one. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pull some strings on that one. You guys can, can come and see us soon. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, yeah. Well, that, sounds, yeah. Well, that sounds like a lot going so, on, so, Terrence. Yeah, we, we do. We have employees. 
uh, people helping me write tours. Joseph from uh, Knit in uh, Germany, he's writing tours for me. So I'm not the only tour writer, which is interesting because I have to read his tour and see how geeky it is and then add points and tell him, oh, you got to change this, this, and this. He's very good. He's, he's a professional tour guide, so he's very good at writing and, and doing tours. So That's I'm, awesome. I'm very happy to so have you've him. done lots you've and done lots of tours now. Tour. Yes. What is your funniest tour story, funniest thing to happen on a tour, other than getting hacked by Greeks? Yes, by no, we didn't get hit by geeks. Greeks. We got hacked by Greeks. Right, right. <laughs> well, it must be well, geeks by definition. I thought we did that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I think the funniest one still is one of my first uh, managers in the UK tour. Uh, we went to, uh, we did a whole bunch of stuff prior to getting to Nottingham, and it was the day before. Uh, games day and i didn't know we were at the hotel we were excited we were uh, arrived in nottingham and we're we we didn't have any idea about what we didn't have any idea about what what to expect at games day but people were checking in at the hotel and we were thinking maybe there's going to be someone that checks in at the hotel that that is uh, famous. So, so we're sitting there. Uh, we all got checked in, and then I had to ask this all these people about. Uh, I had to ask the front desk about a, a few issues, minor issues that we had. And uh, this guy in front of me, I swore that he said that he his name was Rick Priestley. Mm-hmm. And I had never seen Rick met Rick Priestley before, so I had no idea what he looked like. I guess if I were to <coughs> try to remember my white dwarf days, I would have saw a picture of him or two, but I didn't. So I'm like, excuse me, are you Rick Priestley? And he's like, yeah, man, that's who I am. And we're talking back and forth, and we're gonna, and and I'm, and then finally he's saying like, yeah, I'm going to go out. Are you coming out tonight? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, come out to this whole. Uh, uh, party we're having, and we kind of broke up and everything. I'm like, he's he, he, Rick Priestley invited me to this kind of rave party. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I walked by, and then he came in again and uh, kind of gave everybody a wave. And then I said, I said, I looked at him. I go, I, I said, you're Rick Priestley, and he goes, who? <laughs> so he was he was a DJ. <coughs> at a r- local rave that was checking out at the hotel and he had nothing to do with miniatures <laughs> or being Rick Priestley at all. And everybody f- knew that I thought it was Rick Priestley. <laughs> so I was the butt of many of a joke, but that, d- and it was very, very funny. Everybody laughed because <coughs> he absolutely does not look like Rick Priestley at all. <laughs> like a zero. Now what his and, name, was his name actually Rick Priestley? <coughs> no, I had no idea. Oh, okay. I, he told me his name and I had no idea what his name was, but but um, that kind, it was funny, but at the same time, that kind of showed that I was a fanboy too. Mm-hmm, right. Like I was like, oh my God, I met Rick Priestley. That wasn't Rick Priestley. So I, to this day, people say, how's Rick Priestley to me in the hallway sometimes at Adepticon? Ooh, that's a great story. I like the one. <laughs> yeah. I hear he's great at weddings. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> so he is. what about... Um, what about- like, what's your most unexpected discovery? So you're going on a tour, and what's the most unexpected thing you've you've had happen since you've been doing this? Sure, um, I think it's the emotional, the emotional responses some of my clients have, and the emotional responses that I have, and I I, I think that it can't, it can't. Uh, I never know when that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like I never know when someone on the tour is going to have an emotional response or I'm going to have an emotional response. There's lots of uh, stories I, I like to tell about that, but you know, there's one that I haven't really told. Uh, we went to my Gettysburg tour and after my Gettysburg tour, we did Washington DC. So we did the, the mall mm-hmm. and uh, I had a Vietnam vet on my tour and he said he wanted to see the the, the memorial, yep. of course. And we went there and everything, and and uh, you know he's telling us war stories and stuff, and and nothing too 
for lots of emotion there, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, we didn't we didn't really put two and two together, and and uh, finally he came up and said, "I'd like to give you these pieces of paper so you can etch out some of my comrades that never made it back." Mm-hmm. So I, I, uh, him, and another buddy of mine that was also on the tour, and uh, his friend etched uh, his uh, comrades names on for oh, wow. uh, oh, wow. on the wall yeah that that was that was pretty heavy i was pretty beaten up by that so <clears throat> that's that's a that's an emotional response but um we also had i think craig you were here uh, at our gen con one where, when we did artemis yes yeah. yeah you were you did artemis with us right yeah. And uh, so I had, I think, six rooms, six bridges going on at the same time. Yeah, was cool. And I was, I was the admiral. Yeah. And yep. and I had to send each starship to a certain uh, segment of space, and you guys had to fight it, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, and it was super amount of fun. It was awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and uh, so it was a lot of fun, and you guys all were fighting, and each each bridge was different. Some bridges were quiet. Some bridge had a captain that was screaming out what to do, and and it was just so many collages of, of people just really, really enjoying themselves. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just really, and each bridge was alive with this energy of having fun and just loving the whole thing whole experience and that right there for me mm. is that's when i say i win i've won um and by one i just mean i've succeeded in getting people having a really good time oh yeah oh yeah yeah and i think that that for me is a big emotional time because i'm like you know perfect this is the exact vibe i intended for this to happen and here it is unraveling right in front of me that's awesome awesome. yeah that's for me that's the best that's cool cool. so so you shared something with me when we were at adepticon that i thought was really interesting that i think our listeners like to hear about you started a scouting thing right so and you started what a youtube channel recording your scouting adventures yeah so what we explain scouting yeah okay (laughs) okay so what we do is we go to a destination mostly where we haven't been before but sometimes where we've we've uh, we've been before, but we're trying to find a new place. Okay, uh, uh, an example of both would be uh, going to Estonia and not never being being. Oh, actually, going to York is a good example. Going to York, never being there before, but trying to think of how to make York work with our miniature in the UK tour. So yeah, so. And that's what we do is we, we scout out a new location and add it to what, how, how we do a specific tour. And we look at places that are new and then just try to r- work out the logistics of getting there. So that's how, what a scout is. So, so this year, as you just said, we started to film wherever we go. And we're, what we hope with that is to show people kind of how we build tours, mm-hmm. kind of a new place, have a lot of people that have never traveled before and can't get let them see a new place through a geek's eyes. So mm-hmm. everything is always going to be through a wargamer eyes or for my eyes. And I consider myself a pretty solid geek. So everything will always have that kind of geeky feel. And that's kind of one of the f- flares about this uh, or one of the segments of this this new youtube venture we also are going to visit gamers and game with them and talk about their lives and their and their collections um and uh ask them what that why how they game and what type of gamer they are and 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 what they like about miniature war gaming uh, so that's going to be another one, and then we're going to also talk to cosplayers. If we're if cosplayers, or we're going to talk to people at whatever convention, whether it's a Star Trek convention or Gen Con or something like that. And then, of course, we're going to show show all the places we go again as through a geeky kind of uh, look. Nice. Yeah. And are those now, live now? Or are they coming soon? They're very soon. Um, when this goes live, I'm hoping maybe. One or two weeks later, the the first oh, one. Cool. Will be. So and, middle of June, middle of June, twenty eighteen. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, you know, like when you say you go and you meet with gamers and you play games, like who, what kind of gamers are you talking about? You just go to a local store and pick three guys or are well, it's gonna, more well-known people? It's going to be a mixture. Cool. So the first one, the first episode will, I believe, be with um, um, John Stollard from Warlord Games. Oh. So, uh, John, we, we went to a Warlord and we interviewed John about uh, how he, what, what he, what he, how he, how he sees wargaming, what he likes about wargaming. And that's very, very interesting. And then we went to his place and we gamed at his place on his table. Wow. Which was a huge honor for me. Yeah. Uh, John uh, and Warlord Games, Mantic Games, and all those guys have all been super, super supportive. Uh, John really helped me out on building my miniatures in the UK tour. And he's mm. very, very, it's, it wouldn't have really started without John in a lot of ways. Okay. But, uh, and I visited his house uh, before, but I've never gamed on him. So I kind of said, John, I, uh, I really want to come and play. And, and he's, he's like, oh, yeah, of course. Come on. Let's, let's game. <laughs> cool. And, and it was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I missed that. What, what kind of game what kind of game does he have? Uh, he has this quite a large room. Mm-hmm. It's lined by, uh, uh, some armor, swords, miniatures from, from his GW days to his to uh, Warlord, uh-huh. uh, he has some uh, guns that are are all uh, how do you say uh, not able to be not non functioning guns okay. uh, for just display purposes. Uh, he's got these cabinets that light up, mm-hmm. and his miniatures are inside the cabinets. Everything from Bertonians to Napoleonics. Uh, he took, takes out a couple miniatures every once in a while and says, take a look at this guy. A beautiful art. Uh, yeah, he's just got a great space. Uh, it's very large. Uh, larger than you would expect for a place in Britain, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, at someone's house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we played... Uh, this I don't think it'll spoil the the the. Um, oh, it'll make people more interested. Yeah, I don't think it'll spoil the video anyway. But he he John ran the game, uh-huh. and so we played uh, Bolt Action World War Two. Cool. It was super amount of fun. That game is crazy fun, yeah. and he ran the game. And he would say like it was the I believe the Americans, yeah, the Americans versus the Japanese, and. Um, he would say, okay, get your orders through. What are you doing? Uh, he would kind of be the, du- he was like the dungeon master of the game, basically, is what he was. And it was so much fun. It was crazy amount of it, full of laughter and joy and, mm-hmm. and just, and, and the pace was perfect. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was, it wasn't competitive. It had just let's get let's go and and what's happening next and yeah, it was it was amazing. It was an amazing experience and and quite like I said, quite an honor. So I get a lot of those. I get a lot of the, that's one of the things that I also have an emotional response from is is a all the people that are so kind and 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 uh, I, I wish I could just give a shout out to all of them, but we'd be here forever that uh, have helped me. Uh, including you guys, actually, and but um, just the people I've met over this stint is is an amazing thing because uh, um, people are just positive, but also willing to invite me into their house and and willing to be to have me near them and to know me mm-hmm. and and i've i know a lot of people now in this industry and 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 yeah I, I wish i could hang out with each and every one of them more that's awesome no oh, it sounds like it's a very cool idea for videos yeah yeah thank, thank you i think it will be i think it's going to be really inter- interesting we're going to go from uh, uh our next i think next year well how i started this year was we landed in vegas and went to the star trek convention we drove across the united states uh route 66 all the way across the united states 
we so Route 66 was a possible tour that That's we were awesome. looking into. Any uh, any gaming uh, opportunities on Route 66? There, we did a, we did a little bit of gaming. I don't think we filmed too much gaming on Route 66. Um, we were trying to figure out how to make it a tour, mm. and I think that one was it was soon apparent that the whole point of route 66 is doing it yourself and finding it kind of like a uh, almost like a little, little journey little journey yeah like a little journey but also you know trying to find the spots that you really like yeah. or stopping at at and talking and here's the big thing route 66 in my opinion is all about the ca- not the ca- not only the cafes that you stop in but who you talk on mm-hmm. the route like all those people that are traveling that route want to talk about their stories about who they are. And that's really, you can't do that as on a bus. Right, 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 right. You want to be right. able to, to, to talk to those people individually. And so I think route 66 just wouldn't be, uh, is, isn't, I think a great idea for a tour, but I think it would, it's not, I don't think you would get the feel, the right feel mm-hmm. of route 66. Cool. So, um, so anyway, so we drove across there. Uh, we uh, uh, he, Alex left me in Oklahoma. I continued to drive to St. Louis. Then Route 66 ends, of course. Oh, by the way, we made a a, 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 a su- truth, uh, sorry, a detour south mm-hmm. to uh, New Mexico. Went to the very large array. Yep. Uh, that's the one. That's the radio telescopes you see. On yeah, the I saw your movies. pictures on Twitter uh, from that. That looked awesome. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. And uh, then we left from St. Louis. I went to uh, Green Bank Radio Telescope in West uh, West Virginia. Yeah, East Virginia. And uh, anyway, so I went there and uh, 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 visited them. I did game there. I gamed in the Drake Lounge where they where they actually got the uh, Drake, Frank Drake came up with the, or discussed with likes of Carl Sagan and, uh, and other people about the Drake equation, which calculates how many, how much intelligent life there is in the universe. Right. I played, I played eons there, which was really an amazing experience. I was sitting in the same furniture that they sat in because all those chairs from the sixties are still there. And then I went up to uh, uh, Gen Con. So I drove all that and went to Gen Con. We filmed in Gen Con. And then we filmed at the LVO in Vegas. Uh, we also filmed in Japan. So that's our first season. That's all. That's that's the stuff that we have coming up for your, for everybody. To watch. Wow, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Wow, that, sounds, that sounds super cool. Yeah. Super- yeah, I think, I think people like it. That's awesome. So I've always wanted to ask you so this question. We've already established your successful, established tour maker. successful tour maker. But uh, what's your greatest tour idea that you thought was fantastic but just didn't work out? Like, was so crazy, but it didn't work out. Oh. You know, I think I would have to say Little Bighorn. I've, really? We had some... Yeah, you know, uh, I'm very interested in that, that uh, period of history. And we were going to travel from, from battlefield to battlefield all the way leading up to Little Bighorn. And then we were going to take go by horseback three hours and take the same trek that Custer took mm-hmm. into uh, the the uh, little bit Bighorn area by horseback, and uh, it was the I think the tour was a little bit pricey because of that, but it would have been such an outstanding experience because you just I really wanted to get that whole feel of 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 course both sides that whenever i go to a battlefield i always try to make sure that we see both sides we go through the reasons of why this happened in the first place right. uh the, the the terrible nature of it uh the the also the the why it's interesting mm-hmm. and i think that too i was very proud of that tour and it, it just it uh, it just didn't happen I, I, I can't tell you why i think it was a little expensive because like i said the horseback thing really mm-hmm. caught, uh, put it over over the edge for a lot of people i think but that would have been i think an outstanding tour to, to that would have been awesome to, i'd have gone on that yeah a dip into history yeah right right, right. 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So Terrence, what's coming this year from Geek Nation Tours? What's the big new hotness? What you'll be looking forward to? Uh, presently, right now, I'm I'm working on a Frostgrave uh, tour, actually, to ooh, Estonia. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. As as Craig knows, I'm a big uh, Frostgrave uh, fan. And uh, so uh, we got a chance to play Frostgrave at Adepticon. That's why Absolutely. I am watching it. And uh, Russ, you were there. I was. Uh, I enjoyed watching. It was fantastic. Coaching us on. Yes, yeah. that was very a lot of fun. Uh, also, uh, a day of laughter and fun and, and, mm-hmm. and a really enjoyed the game. Yeah. But but yeah, that's where Frostgrave was actually uh, the theme of Cross Frostgrave was uh, inspired by Joe's uh, uh, visit to Tallinn, Estonia. So we're gonna retra- uh, repra- uh, retrace those steps and just play Frostgrave all the way through. And we're gonna go in February, so it's it'll be a little bit chilly out there. It'll like be a grave. Yeah. 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 Like a grave. Yeah, exactly. We're going to try to do spooky stuff. There's a, <laughs> there's a, uh, uh, tour at night. We're going to go into the woods, the deep woods. Ooh. And, uh, apparently the Estonians, uh, believe that, uh, well, not all the Estonians, but, uh, I would, uh, enough that I would mention it, <laughs> uh, believe that they're, uh, dead, Go into the sp- the spirits. Go into the trees, uh, or some such old legends. Of course, this is the mm, old times. Right, right. So, uh, so I'm sure it'll be spooky. Uh, we're gonna do a whole bunch of medieval stuff. We're gonna have a tour guide, a second tour guide on much of it that is a living history person, mm-hmm. and uh, we're gonna just try to go the whole medieval route, and then then right after that, the extension will be into St. Petersburg. So, wow, that's wow. Uh, yeah, so that one is is a big one. Again, our Japan trip. I'm going to start building that one. Uh, we've got a Cold War one that's really interesting. Ooh. That's kind of a yeah. We're going to do. It's kind of like the the Amazing Race. There's, we're going to have kind of spy stuff happening all the oh, way that through it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be a really cool. It's a cool idea. It's very different for us to do. Uh, each day, you you have to accomplish a goal. Like an escape groups. vacation. Like an escape vacation. Yeah, you're going to be actually like in Berlin or on on the train doing stuff, and yeah, yeah. You got to go to Dirty Nelly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that's exactly what it's going to be. So, so that one's coming. Of course, our uh, Essen. That's a big one. Uh, if you, we still have spots on that one, we're partnering with uh, Rodney Smith from Watch It Played on that one, and he's going to be on the tour. So that's a kind of a good one for us too. Um, uh, tons of stuff, man. We got wow. Maybe I should even look at the our site <laughs> and and try not to re- remember everything. Yeah, um, just a lot going on. Of course, right at, right at this moment, actually, our Adepticon tour is almost sold out. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it's awesome. Crazy. It's just. Yeah, it is really awesome. I, I uh, there's absolutely nothing I can. Oh, and let me ask you this, Terrence: Is Adepticon easier to to seat than Gen Con? To uh, to get people to, yeah. to come? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, think I wonder so. why that is. Do you have any theories? I, I've, I've noticed uh, that. Like, I know the Gen Con tours sometimes. I mean, I think the Gen Con tour is wonderful, and Adepticon. And quite frankly, yeah. if I were going to go on a tour, I definitely. Like I think Adepticon is more manageable as a, as a as a na as a newbie than a, than Gen Con is, so I would yeah. think it'd be the opposite. But I'm surprised. I'm just curious if you if you have any insights into that. I don't know. I, you know, I, it might be our marketing. Yeah, that we've 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 kind of um, haven't marketed it as well as our Adepticon yeah. tour. Gen Con, though, you got to remember our Gen Con includes the hotel. So oh, right. so you think that that would be. I mean, it's expensive, mm-hmm. and maybe that's one of the things because downtown hotels. I pick mm-hmm. a nice downtown hotel, not not a uh, you know one of those right. five stars five stars, hotels. baby. So we heard right, right, and those those hotels are expensive. So we go at Gen Con is all about you know top end stuff, right? Uh, we have uh, it's very similar to Adepticon because we have a guest mm-hmm. each night from the industry, at least one, maybe two. Uh, you guys are there, so for, for we have you. So which we're is expensive. No. God knows. Oh my god. Yeah, I know. Right. Oh, 
<laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, so they're very similar. So I, I'm hoping it's a marketing because I think I've solved it. Um, but it, it is a little bit harder one. I think it might be just a little bit tighter on the budget scale, okay. I think, too. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it's all it's all up and up. Like we try to make sure that everybody knows exactly what they're getting and, and they get some really awesome stuff with Gen Con also. Yeah. yeah. Not uh, the least of which yeah. is not having to worry about your hotel room. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we also uh, uh, have gaming space all the time, which is always hard to get when you're at Gen Con, it seems. Uh, also we have, you know, meals that are all taken care of and, and we have a group of awesome people that love the same thing. No, I, I think that the Gen Con tour is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, I, again, one that I'm proud. Of. I would, I would agree with Russ 100. Like the Adepticon, you can, you can easily do yourself. The Gen Con is so daunting and so large, mm. and you do such a good job of distilling it down and making sure everybody yeah. hits all the highlights. Yeah, and then, and your 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 guys contribution to the whole thing is really important too like we have that conference call uh before we pick our stuff and so everybody kind of gets every you know a veteran's view on what you should be going to see and Mm -hmm. and how to how many events to go to and everything so we really try to even before you get to gen con we really try to take care of you to make sure that you know exactly what you're getting into and and what you're getting out of the whole thing and and just you don't have to worry about you know logistics i make sure i get you up in the morning and we go and and wait outside to get into the vendor hall or get you off to a cool gaming thing and and maybe give you some advice on how many to get you know how many how many events to do so i think i i think it's a great tour and i think that it's 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 well worth it i i just think that we have to market it more i think that that's the big one we i think we've kind of fall down on on uh getting the word out i mean i know that you guys get the word out so but it's you want to have as much uh reach Mm -hmm. as possible so and i think that i've really started to work on that a lot cool yeah. Well, Terrace, thank you so much for the update. This has been fantastic. I've, I've loved all, learning all the new new things coming and also all some of the great stories. I can't wait to watch the video. I know, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're going to really like it. Like I said, the first one's John Stollard. So um, I think – and then, of course, we'll have the long – the the short version of him and I gaming and interviewing. And then we'll have later – the, sh- the long version of the interview. Awesome. So, awesome. so yeah, we're going to have uh, lots from Warlord. We'll probably have Warlord in itself will be probably three episodes. Nice. That's great. So, so to check yeah. all that out, head over to geeknationtours.com and I'm sure you'll have links to all your videos and everything from there right there. We sure will. Excellent. Yeah. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days, Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbucks is a guy, and Lestat, now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your total fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakeland and check out all I'm up to over at NicoleWakeland.com. Our shout out is to all of our wonderful supporters at Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash the D6 generation and you too can support the show. So I had an interesting thing happen the other day, and it's one of my favorite little random occurrences. When you have someone that you're dealing with that you have no idea that they're a nerd, I mean, it could be like the guy, uh, you know, at the counter at the corner grocery store, it could be your dentist, it doesn't matter who it is, random dude in the grocery store, and you somehow find out someone completely unexpected is actually sort of a nerd underneath it all, and you have this little common thread you didn't even know you had. Well, this happened to me in the weirdest of ways the other day. So both of my girls take classes online to supplement what they take at the high school. It's because they want to take extra stuff, uh, especially my oldest. She's all about taking every conceivable difficult math course possible, which means she has to th- take the thing she thinks is easy, like social studies and English and gym, and she takes those online. And yeah, you can take gym online. They make you write papers. And for a kid like my daughter, that was far preferable to actually participating in gym class. So they have these teachers, and I never meet them. I mean, we talk to them a little bit. You have, like, a little conference call, so they, you know, make sure that you know your kid's taking an online course and that you know what your kid's responsible for, and you have an email so you can reach out to them, that kind of thing, like a little introductory thing. But I never see these teachers. I, You know, I they're not really a part of my life. But the girls deal with them. They have them for, you know, however many months it takes them to complete the class, and then they're done. 
one of her teachers is a little bit more communicative this summer. And this particular teacher, I think she's trying to make sure that when the summer months come along, the kids just don't kind of forget that they've signed up for a class. Because if you don't keep up with a certain amount of work or you don't do any for a certain period of time, it automatically assumes you're not completing the class. So she sort of touches base and she'll tell you when she's going out of town on vacation, if there's another teacher covering for her. And, you know, when you've said that you're going out of town, she'll tell you, you know, okay, this is what you have to do before you go. Well, she sent a message saying that she was going out of town for something and who her teacher was. And at the bottom, she has like a little Star Trek meme at the bottom of the thing. And I'm like, is that a Star Trek meme attached to the bottom of this official email that this teacher sent regarding being out of town for a couple weeks? Oh my gosh, it is. I thought it was hilarious. So I immediately messaged this teacher who I've never met and only talked to for 2.5 seconds when they said, are you okay with Rose taking a class? Sure. Okay, thanks. Bye. And I said, that is amazing. You are absolutely my favorite teacher the girls have ever had online simply for using that Star Trek reference at the end of your email. And she responds back that she's so excited. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm such a closet nerd. I'm a huge old school Star Trek fan and puts another little meme on the bottom. So we go back and forth chatting and sending memes back and forth, little pictures, little we're having fun with this, right? Now she had to send me an email for something completely unrelated just to let me something know, let me know something was going on. And she signs it live long and prosper and there's a little picture of Spock. This is my favorite thing ever that I finally found a teacher online who is like doing a great job with the class that they're teaching the kids and who also happens to be a nerd. It remains to this day when I find random nerds out there one of my happiest moments. It sort of lets you know like, yeah, there's more of us out there than you'd ever think. Welcome back. And since we have Jeff here on the show, how you doing, Jeff? Hey. <laughs> hey. He's getting old, people. I wasn't, I wasn't oh. going to call me off guard there. I was waiting for the intro. Which segment has the Canadian in it? There you go. Uh, not this one. Uh, since Jeff's on the show, now, Jeff, how long have you been teaching uh, gaming now at college level? Um, I have just completed my third year. Three years. It seems like only yesterday you were telling us you were excited to start, and now you are. When do you get tenure? <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's a no. <laughs> yeah, I'm still so, waiting to get a desk. That's that's really what I want. <laughs> yeah, so, so but I want to really, I thought it'd be kind of fun to, and we talked about this, I think, when you first got the gig. Uh, it's been a while now, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you've learned and evolved um, the class, but like, like, um, how does this like start? Do people come in and they're like, yeah, I want to learn game theory. Like, like what is your typical student? Like that's coming to this class. Are they, are they future game designers? Are they other kinds of majors, but they really want to understand this kind of thinking? Where, where do you get? It's really kind of all over the place, which, which makes it a bit of a challenge with this specific class. So the, um, and, and it's evolved over the years also, but where, where we're at now is it's, it's offered to both, um, undergrad and graduate students. Um, and it's sort of a general NYU class, although there is a prerequisite. The prerequisite is game design one. Um, so you have to have taken that. Um, and uh, I made the mistake one year of not really enforcing that requirement. <laughs> and uh, I can talk about that a little bit later, <laughs> where that would be wrong. But, um, you know, typically if it, I, I want people to have taken that or I want them to have played a lot of games. Um, most of the students that take the class are want to do video game design. Um, so there is a there is a formal game design program that's an MFA program and a BFA program at NYU. Um, and um, I, about two thirds of the students, three quarters of the students are usually in that program that take this class. Um, and of those, you know, like I said, most of them typically want to do a video game, get a video game degree or, or do that as their, um, you know, their, their they, career. Do they know that your class is not video game design? Yes, yes, yes. It's called board game design. That's, that's the name of the class. So they, so this was they know what they're getting into, but they, you know, they, they like to uh, learn about other, other ways of approaching gaming. Well, this is really cool. Actually, a couple, I, I want to come back to game design one requirement because I think that's interesting, but, but I was just watching uh, the E3 coverage, you know, electronic gaming, uh, electronic entertainment expo yeah. that just happened earlier this month. And uh, Ubisoft had their little, you know, their, their, uh, their presentation and, and you could watch the whole thing live 
And as part of their presentation, I thought this was really interesting. They were interviewing the various employees at Ubisoft and talked about what it was like to work there. And to a person, they all talked about game developers, QA people, everybody, how during breaks throughout the day, they all played board games. All of them. Yeah. And they played board games to to get into game mechanic design. And in fact, they talked about how for some of their games, like Assassin's Creed Origins, they actually made board game mechanic versions of some of the moments in the video game they were trying to build to work through the mechanics. And they showed the guy like making cards and everything. So like. Do you see some of that? Like the people come into class kind of knowing about that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, most of the people that come in, they, there's like a, as part of the game design one class, there's like a gaming literacy thing. So they have to have played, they've played Dominion, they've played Pandemic, there's there's a certain, play Catan, there's there's a certain list of games that they make that kids play before they get to the class. Oh. Um, but um, I was recently out in Salt Lake City, as I mentioned at this tabletop network conference, and there was a lot of uh, video game designers they were presenting also there was some folks from blizzard and and uh, from some other companies and the presentations they gave they were about how they do tabletop versions of the video game mechanics and that's that's the way they prototype that a lot of ways and they just you know they they make these mock-ups and they try to they show uh, pictures of a bunch of different things and you know video games more so than they used to be when video games first started um it, I think they were more focused on mechanics. There was, there was sort of like a little valley there. So like in the 70s and the 80s, they were super focused on mechanics because the graphics were lousy. Right. And then the graphics got good in the 90s. And um, uh, the people just focused on that and didn't worry about the games. You know, they were like, if it's if they can run through a, a card or whatever, we'll do that. And, you know, as it's gotten into you know, the retro graphics and and, and other mm-hmm. things where, you know, any computer can do anything at this point, it's um it's a, it's not a tech demo anymore and they're getting back to basics on the mechanics and what can you do with this mechanic and how can you you know take this specific feature of you know mario throwing his hat or whatever what different directions can we take that in and how do we balance it and how do we make it enjoyable for the players and so there's a lot of cross fertilization between board games and video games and in both directions so you know this they're the video game people are dipping into board games to get ideas and the board game people are looking to the video game world for inspiration in terms of story and narrative and stuff like that. So, so there's definitely a lot of interest that way. And for the students, because they, it's hard to make a video game, forget about making a board game. We'll talk about that, but certainly a video game, a full fledged video game in a class, they spend a lot of time mocking things up and, and, you know, pushing around pieces of paper and cardboard and stuff like that. Is there, go ahead, Craig. I was just going to say, it sounds awesome. It does sound really interesting. Is, do you find there's a type of, uh, you know, when I took engineering in school, the very first thing I did in freshman engineering was get you thinking a certain way. There's a certain kind of um, mental process that they try to get engineers to kind of get to, right? Mm-hmm. When you do problem solving. Mm-hmm. Do you find that in, is there a, is there a game design uh, thought f- approach that you try to get into your students or do you find that students come with? And is that one of the reasons game, des- game design one is sort of a requirement? Does it get gamer, you know, students into that mind, that mindset of approaching uh, problems from a certain angle? Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I think that there's uh, the one natural tendency that you have to try to uh, beat out of people and, I, mean, I haven't tried that literally. Maybe I should, but um, I don't know what the rules are at a college. I'd have to check. Uh, I think two hits, <laughs> two hits per student per day. Um, but uh, is 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 getting wildly ambitious? Too many mechanics, mm-hmm. you know, and right. and and it's it's like first time game designeritis, um, you know, and I see this all the time. Um, that it's it's every single mechanic under the under the sun. It's like you're never going to design a game, so every idea you have, you better do now. And um, mm-hmm. and and it's just about focusing. It's about it's it's about understanding constraints, like you do in engineering. Um, you it's if you have to learn a game that has 700 different mechanics, it's very very challenging, right? You know, or if, if you want to play a game that's going to take three or four or five hours, um, you you need to. F- understand what your focus is and what are you trying to do? And I emphasize experience. I mean, that's, you know, we talk about, you know, when you do a specification for an engineering product, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about this is how much it has to cost. And these are the functions it has to have, and this is what it has to be. 
Um, and, you know, game design is no different. Um, you've got to, you know, understand your constraints and work within that framework, which is why I try to give very, when I do assignments, I try to give them good boundaries um, to understand what's going on. And then for the final project, they're free to do what they want. But hopefully at that point, they've got a better understanding of what's feasible within the time frame that they have to put these projects together. Yeah, well, that's right. I, I definitely agree with the constraint drives innovation. I see that all the time in software too. Um, so what is the essentials of game design theory? I'm really curious about why, like what was the, when you started to, to relax the choir requirement of, uh, of game design one, um, what were you finding was the problem? Were students just not coming to your class serious enough for it? Were they, they not even know what gaming really was? Like, well, was yeah, I mean, I was, I was, yeah, a little bit of the above, but you know, we, I, I get a lot of students from the education school. Um, over at Tisch or from the art school. Uh, actually, like one student that was from the arts program and he wanted to be a toy maker. Um, and that was his thing. He came in the first day with a Lego bow tie that he had made himself. Uh, <laughs> it lit up and spun around. That's like, cool. Okay, that's cool. Um, and um, Not really a game, but I love it. Right, but that was his mindset. And he's like, you know, toys or games are sort of adjacent. So let me learn more about games and, and how that and. He did some fantastic work because he came in from a totally different angle. I mean, I come from the mechanics and I start with that. And he came from, you know, the toy experience. What's it going to look like? The artistic side. We get a lot of kids The outside the game design program. The, 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 most of the kids are coming from education. that they, they're, they're planning on becoming teachers and they want to use games in the classroom and, and use games to, to teach things. Um, you know, not just kill time when the seniors are away like Craig does. So... Um, <laughs> You know, and, and I appreciate that, respect that and, you know, want to help them with that. So I, I one year I just I had a couple of, of students that wanted to come into the class and they said, yeah, you know, I played some games, but, uh, you know, didn't take the prerequisite. But I'm like, you know, but I want to use games in the classroom. I'm like, OK, fine. So come to the class. We'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And the first day, the first one of the first things I do is I give uh, all the students a, a questionnaire listing of about 50 games um, where, where they put on there what they what they've heard of at all in any way shape or form or what they've played um, just so I have some idea of what examples I can use and what touchstones I can use and I found out that there was one uh, girl in the class who the only game she had ever played before was back out literally she hadn't played sorry she hadn't played risk she hadn't played monopoly she hadn't played chess she hadn't played checkers she had played back out that was it um, and so I like started talking about victory points in the first lecture at the end of the, the, the thing, she came up to me and she was like, I, what are these victory points? I don't understand that. Uh, I was like, Oh, okay, well, we've got a, you know, this may not be the class for you. Um, and, uh, I tried to convince her to drop the class. She did not end up dropping it. Um, she, she stuck it out, but it was tough. You know, there's, I had her play a lot of extra games and, you know, there's, there's just so much stuff that we take for granted. Um, that you really need to, um, you know, even under the best of circumstances, that it was just a challenge for that she was trying to come into this with with no gaming literacy whatsoever. Yeah, and did you do you have to? Do people come into the class thinking it's an easy A? Yes, hundred percent. They come in and, and this is their blow off class, and I, I did use them of that notion very quickly. Yes, <laughs> you know, and look, if they do the work and they show up and they participate, they're going to be fine. Right. But yeah. yeah, it's not, you know, there's work, there's real work. You know, you got to design right. three full games in over the 14 weeks, which is not easy. And, um, you know, they, they, there's readings and they've got to do projects. And so, so there's, there's a fair amount of work that's involved in this. If you um, really so, enjoy it, it's fun and, and, and not going to sound, seem like work, but it's a lot like a lot of elective classes. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's not, you know, it's not an easy A. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But, um, you know, the the thing that the biggest lack that I see and the, the interesting part is, um, you know, there, there are some kids that come in that have played tons and tons and tons of games um, and uh, others, you know, the backgammon uh, was a little extreme. But most of these kids have not played a lot of games um, that we would consider to be, you know, modern design games. They've played Monopoly and Risk and Sorry, and that's what they've done growing up. Um, and. 
So I spent a lot of time and, and, and a lot of assignments just playing games. There's there's a game library there. I bring in a lot of games from home. Mm-hmm. And that's, they, that's one of the things they have to do is just play through these games. But there's only so many games that you can get through. But as they go through the semester and they start getting exposed to these other ideas and, and you know, how different systems work and what's a worker placement game and what's an area control game and, you know, what, how do you do a modern conflict game? All right. I have to ask. So, so is is playing a game in Jeff Engelstein's class like reading a book in English lit? In other words, after playing the game, you got to write up a report on uh, the game itself and what what the key mechanics are and why the designer chose to do this. Or do you do you make them do any work after they play the yes. game? Or is it yeah, they have like- to they have to do they have to come they have to pick one thing that they would improve in the game and talk about what they would okay. do. Yes. Oh, interesting. Um, but it's you know it's 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 just it's just a long process to get them exposed to that stuff. And I um, uh, actually, and this is a project that I've kind of started in response to that, um, which isn't officially announced yet, but I'll I'll announce it. Uh, but I've been uh, working on a, a book, um, which is like an encyclopedia of game mechanics, board game mechanics. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so it's not like how to design a game. It's just like a catalog of two to three pages on a specific mechanic. Um, you know, how it works, uh, pros, cons, variants, sample games, and then just move on to the next one. Just because when to use it, that kind of right. thing. Oh, so awesome. we've got like 200 to 300 that we've identified. And, um, you know, we've, we've got a publisher, we've signed a contract for it. So it's going to be coming out. Um, so now how is the index next year. Book? Can I, can I, I have to ask this too. How's the index going to work in this? Cause I, if I'm, is this like a, is this a resource book or is it a learning book? In other words, like if I'm, let's say I'm getting ready to design a game and I'm yes. like, you know what I need? I need a really good, uh, you know, drafting mechanic. Can I go and see uh, all the different takes on dra- on card drafting in a section? Uh, yeah. Or let's say I need to, let's say I need a screw your neighbor mechanic. Do I have a section on all the good screw your neighbor mechanics? Like, I, how do you think this is going to going to be laid out? Well, it's um, it's it's each chapter is a broad topic. Like um, there's there's a chapter on turn order and and structure, right? So there's okay. um, so one is like you know there's there's going around the table once. There's first player token moves after each round. There's um, you know simultaneous activation blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, so all yeah. that. So there's so so you go to the category. So we've got that. There's there's actions and how actions work. There's auctions. Worker placement, area control. Oh, Each cool. of these is a, is a major chapter. Card, you know, just kind of miscellaneous card mechanics, miscellaneous dice mechanics, conflict resolution, and and then it just catalogs a whole bunch um, in there. And it's not going to be exhaust. It can't be exhaustive. It's not intended to be exhaustive, but it's intended to. Now your first tweets students. make sense. <laughs> I've been watching your tweets and every once in a while, Jeff will tweet something like, uh, <laughs> uh, I need some examples of games that have like a use once per, per game. Mechanic. Exactly. Like yes. 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 <laughs> now I see. It's all coming together. Sure. Sure. <laughs> right. uh, so, you know, but it's, it, I've shown it to a couple of designers and I'm getting a really positive response out. And I'm excited about giving it to the kids because, you know, as a student, as a textbook, um, a, I've always wanted to be able to assign students a textbook that I wrote since I had to, Suffered right. through that in college, and B, um, you know, I just think it's for for the ones that just haven't played all these games. It's good. I think it's just going to short circuit having to play 100, 200, 300 games to just right. understand it's all these the things and be able to tap into it. It's like, okay, I'm running into a a, a problem, you know, and, and I tell them all the time, look, if you run into a problem, here's my, you know, you can tweet me, you can email me, here's my cell phone number, you know, I am your resource. Let me know what you want to do, and. Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and, and very few of them take advantage of that, which always surprises me. But when they do, I'm like, yeah, look at this game, look at this game, look at this game. They've tackled what you're trying to do a little bit, and that should give you some ideas. But without having that resource, you've got to reinvent the wheel every time. Well, I love that you're writing a book, and anything's better than a Kinko's packet, Jeff. That's <laughs> you remember those? God, those are awful. Yes. Um, awesome. So, like... What are the fundamentals uh, when people start thinking about, you know, coming to your class and they're like, okay, I want to design a game. And I feel like I like, what are the fundamental competencies you kind of think you need to have, you know, not everybody can be an engineer, you know, not everybody can be a software developer. Like, what do you think is the, are the kind of thing, do you think anybody can be a game developer or does it take a certain kind of personality type or core competencies to kind of get you to be passionate about it and make it fun? Cause if it's not fun, maybe it's, not going to be a great product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I think that you've got to, um, you've got to have creativity. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be a creative thinker. I think you have to understand a little bit of human psychology. 
I think you have to have a, some level of competence in, in, in math, not to sit down and do equations, but just a feel for it. Um, and I think you can get through that part of it if you're not, but I think it short circuits things if you, you know, if you understand the probabilities a little bit. Um, uh, and, and just a certain level of, of, you know, persistence, um, you're going to run into roadblocks and you just got to, got to keep trying. Um, but I think that, you know, that creativity and that almost that engineering sense again is, is, is important. I think more even than video games, I think board games have way more constraints than video games, um, in terms of the components and that players have to be able to understand the rules, interpret things and stuff like that. So. Well, it to be physically manufactured and, and it's yeah, exactly. Too, which yeah, is, and interestingly, I, I, I do a lecture it. on um, contracts, designer contracts, and uh, costs. How much it costs to produce things, and sort of the production cycle, and shipping costs, and things like that. And it's like one of the most popular lectures in the class because I think they get so much theory in all, all these classes that to have some actual like, look, here's a here's a quote from a Chinese manufacturer for this game. Right, and, that's and cool. Here's a quote from a German manufacturer for the same game, and this is what they yeah. look like. So. That's awesome. Well, let me ask you about math. Cause of course you do, uh-huh. um, you know, lots of math, uh, segments on various podcasts all the time. Yeah. I think they're fantastic I, as a math nerd myself, although not nearly at your level, I, I love them. Um, but how much, like, is there such a thing as too much math in a, in a, in a, in a game when you're thinking of game design, should the math be up front? Like, can you get away with the kind of ignoring it uh, where, you know, where does that line get drawn in some of these games? Well, I think that there's, I mean, there's, there's different answers to the question depending on the direction you're coming from. First off, in terms of math that needs to be done by the players, I think that should be as close to zero as possible. I mean, even to the point I learned that lesson in Aries Project, and I mean, I, at least for, in terms of the general populace. I mean, I came from a wargaming background, right? So if this was if there was a plus two modifier and a minus one modifier and a two times modifier, that wasn't a big deal for me. You know, I could... I could deal with that. I've played tons of games that had that, but in, you know, we, we had some modifiers like that in Aries project and it just, it, it just really slowed people down um, to have a little chart and have to look it up. And this gives you plus one and this gives you plus two and this gives you minus one. And we really, I, I studiously stayed away from that. I really learned my lesson on that. So you want to keep math as far away from the players as possible, those types of calculations and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of from the design process baked into it, I think it's really important to do it. You know, like I said, you may get there eventually, but it's going to be a lot quicker if you, you know, um, if if you understand them at the beginning. I mean, I had a a prototype that I tested from one of the students that was like, um, uh, the, um, one of one of my students came in with a, with a game that there was a, a die roll or something had to happen to end the game, mm-hmm. and as soon as I read the rules, I was like, "Well, you obviously haven't played tested this game because this is going to take like seven hundred and fifty turns before this set of right. conditions is going to happen." Right. You know, just right. some basic probability will will show you that right. of what you need to do, and um, it's uh, you know testing ultimately is going to is going to get that out of the wash. But it's gonna, it's just gonna get to you, get you where you're going faster. It's like if you're, it's like if you're building a model bridge, you can just build it by trial and error and say, oh, this needs to be stronger. This is where it's collapsing, and do it over and over and over again. But if you know the math behind where things need to go, then you, you have a much better chance of getting it right the first or second time. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that's definitely, um, you know, I think, I think if you play a lot of games, you might develop instincts. Like I hate random game length games it's just a personal passion because i've been in enough games where they never end mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> right yep. that i'm like i would never do that but that's not because i know probabilities cold to know that it's just like i played enough games to be like yeah that's not gonna be you know what it's kind of like you ever watch mythbusters <laughs> so you know like mythbusters is like science based on instinct if you ever watch that sure show. like it's they don't like a lot of the stuff they do, you could run the numbers with math before you even do any experimentation, but it's almost like they do experimentation to learn it from experience. Does that make sense? And I think like you can come at this one or two ways, either from just lots of random trial and error through infinite play testing, or if you know your math and probabilities, you can, you can short circuit a lot of that by avoiding a lot of those pitfalls. Sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where the math comes into it from my perspective, but I try to, 
take as much of it out for the player. I, I recommend that because it just gets in the way of the experience most of the time, which is what I try to emphasize in the class. And so my first lecture is you're trying to give your players an experience. Um, and you right. need to know that that's your, that's your guiding star. And that's, that's what needs to, to carry you through to the end. I love it. I love it. So uh, let me ask you this though. Do you ever, as a game designer and a math guy, do you ever try to sneak in really cool math theory uh, into a game just to do it? <laughs> like this doesn't, it, it still is going to be a great experience or it might help drive the experience, but it's more like, I just want to get like, you know, fractals into this game somehow or whatever. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, the, I, I have, I have some designs on the, on the, the, uh, drawing board that I work on. I mean, I really want to do a game with Penrose tiles, um, mm -hmm. as an example, but, um, you know, and, and there's some interesting things that I drug up from game text, like intransitive dice and stuff like that, that I'd love to work in. But I, I for the most part, I haven't really had the opportunity yet. Got it. Ooh, we have a question from the chat room, Craig, we should probably yeah. take. Do you want to read Good. that one? Um, yeah. Uh, so Keith has a question, and I think I might know the answer, but we want to hear it from you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anywhere online where any of your lectures are? Now, I think like the, the launching point for this answer might be all the different podcasts that you are affiliated with, right? But are there any specific targeted of your lectures that have made it online? The, um, yeah, the, uh, the NYU class that I give, there's no like online materials or anything like that. Um, where, where they take the lectures, like MIT has their open course where you can go and, and view the lectures, but NYU doesn't do that. So I, I don't have any of my, of tapes of that. Mm -hmm. Um, although for one of our classes, which is us playing mega civilization for three hours. So you could have enjoyed that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, there, uh, I, I have given some lectures at the GDC Game Developers Conference um, in uh, 2017 and 2018, both of those years. So if you go, all of those lectures are online on their YouTube videos, and that was about board games. Um, in fact, it was, there was board game tracks both of those years. Um, so mine and some other folks' lectures were were on there um, that were really good. Um, and Rob Davio gave a fantastic one on legacy games that I would highly recommend from 2017. Uh, and, um, you know, just strictly audio format is, you know, so I have the Ludology podcast, um, which is an hour long and we're up to like episode 170, which is really strictly about game design and game design topics. We do a deep dive into game design, um, every other week. And, um, you know, so that's, if there's a specific topic that you're interested in, that, that's a good place to, to go to. And if anybody is thinking about teaching a game design class or anything, I would be more than happy to share my, um, my syllabus. And any of my the slide presentations or anything that I do, I have no problem with um, sending those out to people that are going to be teaching. Awesome, awesome. So let me ask you this: you you'd mentioned that, um, and I love your your sort of your your touchstone there for the class and your students, which is it's all about the experience you're creating, right? Uh, in the end, um, how does that play into mechanics versus theme? Do you talk about that much uh, uh you know the theme concept of the game and how important theme is to the game or is it are you really more focused on mechanics and how do you advise your students there well we we talk about both theme and mechanics and the purpose of a theme is one of my big um presentations that we taught that we talk about and discuss which is that the theme um you know the mechanics should support the theme and, and the theme should make the mechanics easier to understand um and I talk about, you know, I, I have a, an example that I give where there's, you know, you're just playing a game on a, on a board and you can move pieces and, and there's one piece type that moves one space um, and it's not allowed to move over other pieces. And you've got another piece that can move two spaces is also not allowed to move over other pieces. And this third piece can move three spaces and it is allowed to move over other pieces. Um, and but it has to move when it moves. And, you know, I, I, and I list like four or five pieces and it's very confusing to people, you know, I ask them later, you know, which which piece, which, how can this piece move or whatever? But then I say, okay, look, piece one is infantry, piece two is a tank, piece three is a plane. And it's like, oh yeah, well, of course it can move over other people. And of course it's faster than the right. other things. And talk about that concept of metaphor and how that, um, you want your mechanics to work hand in hand with that and talk about, you know, some examples of games that have not done that very well. And, and the metaphor doesn't really carry through and just makes it that much harder to learn and be confusing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that this, some people have done great abstract games. Um, there's, you know, obviously for thousands of years, people played abstract games that weren't heavily themed and, and got great enjoyment out of them. So 
um, you know, we, we look at it from different angles, but certainly if you're going to have a theme, it better fit nicely with your, the mechanics better support it to make it easier to learn. Otherwise I'm going to, I'm going to dock you lots of points. Yeah. Do you ever come at it from that? Cause er, earlier this episode, you talked about, you guys are working on, you know, the new Versailles 1919 game. Mm-hmm. And since that's being timed with the hundredth anniversary of the treaty of Versailles from, to me, did, did that come from, is that an example of mechanics first theme second, or is that an example of theme first? And if you start with theme first, like how do you figure out the mechanics, right? Like is, is that, well, that one was a hundred percent theme. Yeah. I mean, I, I was reading a book about the, the, uh, the treaty signing and I was like, Oh my God, this should be a game. This is unreal. Uh, all the amazing history that's involved in here and, and the, the forces that they were having to contend with. And so then, you know, we sat down and I was like, you know, how do I put the players in the shoes? What are the key things that they were trying to decide? What were the decisions that, you know, Clemenceau and Wilson and, and Lloyd George, what were they making at the time? And how do I give the players those choices? Um, and then you just kind of build it in from there. Uh, and, and if only you had a book of every mechanic ever made. Yeah, so it would be a lot easier, sure. Just flip <laughs> through this combination of uh, take right. something from page 12 and something from page 38 and right. boom, you're done. Like build a game, right? There yeah. Um, so what are what are the? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, just one thing that that's I've I've kind of been struggling with in terms of teaching games and um and and game design that I I keep meeting with the other faculty and we keep kicking around and they don't have any great answers. But you know, as a game designer, you know, as I mentioned, we have they have like three game design projects that they need to do in in, in fourteen weeks, and um, you know, when you design a board game. For the most part, it takes um, a year, two years, um, and that that there's a there's an initial part of game design, which is the part I love the most, which is that the first couple of weeks when it's it's all new and it's it's fantastic, and all you've got is ideas, and you throw together some quick prototypes, and yeah, it's a little rougher on the edges, but it basically works. But you see the promise in it, and that rush of excitement, and then there's a long slog death march for the next eight months trying to tune it and trying to fix all the stuff that's broken. And every time you touch this, something else breaks over here and then somebody else plays it and they don't like it and whatever, you know, there's that, there's that iteration and that polish that is such an important part and really separates the really good designers from people that are just, you know, pushing stuff out the door. And I, I have not been able to figure out how to teach that part of it just because it kind of like takes time. And I've been thinking about maybe for next year, just, having them do one game the entire time rather than three different projects approach it from three different directions, maybe, but, you know, have them get some experience that I polish, but, you know, I kind of go back and forth on that because I'm worried that someone's going to get it start with an initial project they don't like, and then they're kind of stuck with it for the rest of the year. So I, I don't know. I'm still kind of playing with that, but you know, that's a problem when you're trying to take what's normally a one to two year process and cram it into four, 14 weeks of having them actually yeah. do it, plus teach them stuff, you know, teach them everything they need to, to learn as they go. Like, how do you write rules and everything else? Right. That is, that's really interesting. I, I love that. And there's so many other aspects of life that are like that too. I think that's really interesting. Um, I, that's, that's really fascinating actually. Mm-hmm. What are some of the, um, what are some of the uh, biggest missteps that people make? You mentioned earlier, you know, people maybe come in and have too many mechanics chock full of their game, but like, what are some signs you're like, oh, yep, this guy's going down that path again. Like, what are the top <laughs> five or six, you know, rules that Ingolstein would say, just don't do that. Yeah. You know, DDT. Um, well, but don't feel like one, one group one time came in and they brought in a, a, a game that was like war, the card game, but they took out all mm-hmm. the fun parts. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. Don't remember um, one <laughs> advice. There's only one mechanic in that game. What the <laughs> How do you take out all the fun parts? Uh, it was like war. You flipped over a card and you compared them. But if it was a tie, you just flipped over another card. You didn't do the three cards face down and then the other oh, card right, face up, right, right. which is the only it's thing that makes that a game. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really just about simplicity. I mean, people tend to come in with, um, uh, you know, like they'll come up with 150 card decks, you know, and they say, like, you got to go through every single card in the deck or whatever. Um, right. or, or all these different features and this and that. And the other thing is just some people, it's just obvious that they haven't play tested it. Um, 
you know, and it's, I, I don't know how they pretend like they think they're getting away with it. I mean, it's just, you know, there, there's just obvious, obvious flaws that, that would have been apparent if they had given you a modicum of testing. So don't, don't show up to my class with a game and say that you've tested it and it's ready to go. And it's, you know, it's obvious that you haven't. So testing is so important. You can do all the theory in your head, but until it actually gets out on the table and people start pushing pieces around, you don't really know where you're at. Right. You got to, you got to play the game. So the biggest mistake is not playing your own game. Right. Right. And do you think it's important? Like when in the process should you be trying to get your rules legible, uh, usable without the game designer there? Like, is this something that a game designer should be in the beginning, handing rules to other players and saying, figure my game out? Or is it better to kind of explain the rules as the game designer and have the people play it so you can refine the rule. Like you do know what I mean? You know what I'm going yeah, with? Yeah. The, like, well, yeah. I mean, doing that kind of, that's called blind play testing. So doing blind mm-hmm. play testing is, is typically one of the very, very last things that you do before you're releasing right. a game. Um, and, and what happens before that is typically when I'm doing it, the game, you know, the designer will just explain it or whoever's, you know, doing it will explain the game and, and teach it and answer questions and stuff like that. I don't expect people to read the rules early on. Now, having said that, and I, I let people, you know, I, they have to turn in the rules when they turn in their projects. But I, um, uh, you know, I uh, teach, give them an option in terms of rules because I talk to designers and people do it all. There's, there's two very um, uh, warring camps that are adamant about this. I <laughs> like to write down the rules as I go. Okay, so I, at any given point, I've got a rules document, which is pretty solidly explains the game. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I, but I know other designers that say, Jeff, you're insane and a crazy person because, you know, it's going to change. Um, right. It's going to change so frequently. You're just driving yourself crazy. Um, the test, the litmus test though, that I like and that I try to explain to the kids is if you can't write a rule down in like two sentences, Right. You got a problem. You got a problem. That's a bad sign. Uh, you know, even right. if it's super clear in your head and I, and just as a computer programmer, when I sit down and write down rules, that's that just in my brain, that's when I start seeing the edge effects and what happens if there's a time, what happens if it starts at zero and you know, all that other stuff that you have right. to deal with in, in coding. So, um, so, you know, they got to turn in rules at some point, but yeah, that, that kind of blind play testing where I'm just going to give somebody a really polished rules that's got the images and they got to learn from that's a really last thing because that's usually after they're all typeset and there's, there's pictures and examples and everything. Awesome. Hey, I think we got another question from the chat room here from Keith. Uh, okay. Craig, you want to share that? One? Uh, this is awesome. Cause I didn't even know this existed. So his son is in the boy Scouts. He's 13 years old and apparently they have a game design merit badge, yep. which is cool. And he was just wondering if, uh, if your offer of a sil- of the syllabus or the class that you teach, uh, if it if if the material can be simplified for kids that age and that uh, that attention span, like are there a few core principles that you that you kind of adhere to that might translate into a more simplified um, curriculum? Um, what I would suggest, yeah, I, you know, I think my curriculum may be a little bit too advanced for thirteen year olds, and just you know, it's it's more technical and stuff like that. But again, when I was out at the Tabletop Network conference, um, there was a presentation from Kathleen Mercury, who uh, she teaches seventh grade uh, gifted program, and the, it's an entire year class on game design for for seventh graders, which is that exact same age. Um, and she was showing some of the stuff that they did. And um, in fact, she just recently posted on Board Game Geek. She posts, uh, uh, she registers all the games and posts pictures of all the games in a giant geek list, and have people comment on them and vote on them and stuff like that. And the kids love that. Um, and she's got a really good process for that, um, mainly of having them play uh, play some really simple games. <clears throat> and I'd have to go back to my notes and see what they were, or I could, you know, I could. I'm sure I could get the presentation from her. But she'll like have them play. Um, like, uh, where's my fish or that's my fish, for example. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then she has some, you know, design exercises again, just trying to expose them. Cause they just, kids that age typically just haven't seen that kind of stuff. And, and, um, you know, the, the question asker, since, uh, he's listening to the show is probably, um, not in this camp and, you know, probably has played these games with the kids, but a lot of them haven't. And so just, she plays these really simple games, get bit 
stuff like that. That's just going to be quick and fun for the kids. Then that, that kind of gets their creative juices going and she's got sort of this iterative process. So um, certainly if the person wants to, you know, drop me something on Twitter or email, I can, I can probably get a copy of that presentation for it, but that it was, it was super valuable information for that age group. That's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Jeff, we're getting to run along here. Thank you so much for taking time. But first, yeah, before we go, first, what, rumor what is the new a, Yeah. What about <laughs> yeah. this whole Mesopotamian mess? Yes. So uh, we're, we're super excited. Um, my original co-host from Lithology, Ryan Sturm, and I co-designed a game called, uh, which is being released by TC Mitchell called Trade on the Tigris. And it's Ooh. actually, I am pretty confident now going to be for sale at Gen Con. Um, so, Ooh, so that's going to be exciting. Actually, at Dice Tower Con, uh, which is coming up as of this recording in, in a week or so, and it's in about a week in the past, uh, there will be the first pre-production copies. So people will get a chance to um, to play those, and I'll get a chance to see the actual production copy because I haven't really seen all the artwork and stuff. So I'm very excited about that. And this game has been long in the making. This goes back to like 2012 is when we first started working on this project. So this is like a five that or six year really project. Awesome. I have to ask you though, and I don't know. I'm sure Tom Vassell will ask you this question too. But uh, if it's trade in the Tigris, is it technically a trading in the Mediterranean okay, game? So, or so, 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 so the game was originally called Trading in the Mediterranean. OK, <laughs> we started designing it and we said we want to design a trading, a trading in a Mediterranean game. We want to show that it can be fun and we want to do one that Tom will like. And we call it trading in the Mediterranean and it's fun and it's quick. I'm really, really happy with this game. I mean, it's kind of started out as half a joke and we designed it on the air, starting with episode 37, which is a really bad place to design a game. Uh, it makes for riveting, <laughs> riveting podcast listening. But um uh, it's it's really really good. Uh, I'm super excited to to start getting feedback from people. Um, but when we pitched it, we started going around and pitching it to places, and nobody wanted a game called Trading in the Mediterranean. Surprise, surprise! For obvious reasons. Everybody yeah. passed on it, um, and so we went back and we kept the exact same game. We just rethemed it with um, uh, Sumerian stuff and called it Trade on the Tigris. And um, uh, first person we showed it to bought it. So there you go. <laughs> Your theme matters, kids. There it is. There it is, right there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so well, we've got that. We've got the Versailles, um, which is still up for pre-order. If you want to uh, do GM two P five hundred, they give a really substantial discount. And they, unlike Kickstarter, uh, they don't actually charge uh, the card until the game is totally ready to ship. Uh, that's when your credit card gets charged. At that point, you can cancel any time up to then. Um, so if you're interested in Versailles 1919, you can go to gmtgames.com and, and check it out there. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy, busy uh, game design schedule here and spending a little with us. We really appreciate yeah. it. Um, well, thank you so much and, for having and, me. And I guess if, uh, you know, honoring you guys, you know, this, the amount of, of work and, and what you have brought to the board game industry has really, um, you know, it would be a lot poorer place uh, without you having done uh, the work that you've done over the last uh, so many years. So it would, I, I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful and thankful that I've had the opportunity to be a part of the D6G family and that you've invited me to come on and participate in the, the uh, play by mobs and all the other stuff that we've done together. Uh, so um, I, I think you're uh, going to have a well-deserved retirement. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That's very, very too kind, honestly. Um, uh, and and thank you also for being I, I can, I can redo it again if you thought it was a little too kind. I could go back. <laughs> no, no, that's right. That's right. You could be a little crueler. <laughs> I want to re-record that segment. Uh, okay. No, no, it's all good. Okay. No, but, but thank you. We look forward to seeing you also at the Play My Bob uh, at Gen Con this year, Saturday morning, 8 a.m., bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Yeah. There will be coffee. That's all. There will be coffee? Uh, we're we're, we're there giving be coffee? coffee. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to have coffee. I'll bring donuts. Wow. That's right. There we go. You heard it here first. Jeff's bringing donuts. I'm bringing I coffee. Did hear that. I did hear that. There we go. Sound? All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. And yeah. uh, thanks again. Thank you, guys. This, do you ever notice, is brought to you by all of our friends at Patreon. The men, the women, the boys, the girls, the dogs, the cats. I bet there's some horses, maybe a giraffe. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a camel or two in there and an orange teddy bear named Orange Justice. Uh, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be going for as long as we've gone. And who knows how far we can go? It's a very confusing time. I hope pretty far. 
Anyway, today I'd like to thank Shay Wallace, Andrew Wallacher, Aaron Walsh, Ryan Warner, Ross Watson, Ross Watson, Ben Watt, Jonathan Wengler, Simon Christerby, Chris Westerby, Westerby. I just made I made a Chris anyway. Simon Westerby and Christopher Weave. Thank you, all of you, and thank everyone still listening to my voice by the end of a show. Did you ever notice how hard it is to really dissect what you enjoy about something until uh, you have like sort of an epiphany all of a sudden out of the blue? Um, I've always enjoyed writing and um, I have always enjoyed the whole process, except for editing. I really don't like editing. But um, and of course, the process can go in a couple different ways. And um, this is this is actually more in line with where I am writing wise right now, because it's uh, it's been a t- topsy turvy year or so. And um, uh, as many of you know, I've done a lot of writing in the industry um, with my selling of this fantasy novel that I'm now editing. <laughs> um uh, my millionth word that I got paid for is somewhere in that book, which is pretty exciting to me. Um, but lately, that's sort of been a bittersweet realization because um, it's been almost all gaming. And if you think about it, the gaming industry has gone through a lot of changes over the last year or maybe even a bit more than a year. And to me personally, it's been uh, very chaotic and very unfortunate, many of the things that have happened. So uh, my first writing was for, of course, Spartan Games. And uh, Neil uh, Fawcett and all the people at Spartan Games were great, and it was awesome, and I really enjoyed it, and they really gave me a leg up. And and that's kind of how you need to start. You need to sort of uh, establish your bona fides or your bona fides or however you want to say it uh, with a real company. And um, and I did that with them and then almost immediately launched into Fantasy Flight Games doing uh, um, almost every one of their 40K roleplay um, systems at one time or another. And so that was a lot of writing that I did between those two game systems. Uh, and then from Fantasy Flight, I was offered the opportunity to do a really deep dive into the background of Wild West Exodus right at the foundation. So right at the beginning, it was a great, intriguing world. It was really neat. Um, the world had pretty much already been established, but I, I got to sort of shape the edges and kind of inject characters into it that would... It's a really neat concept. You think of it as like fog of war and you've got a vague idea of what's going on. And then you can start injecting these characters almost like scouts into the world. And as they go through the world, they're firming up the world and and more fully realizing it as they travel through it. Uh, and that's really neat. The, the I mean, it's somebody else's world uh, fundamentally, but you're sort of giving it shape as you move through it. And that was that was a really great opportunity. And I think I learned a lot and I wrote a lot of words for those things. Um, when you get down to, I believe it was one, two, three, four, five novels and more than sort of a novel and a half's worth of words in uh, the rule book and then other short stories that I was asked to do and things like that. So that's a lot. That's probably more than half a million of my million words uh, are right there in that one, in that one world. Uh, And that was very cool. And then it got sold. And then Spartan games closed. And then they both got bought by the same company. And then Fantasy Flight lost the Warhammer 40,000 license. And in one fell swoop, what well, wasn't in one fell swoop, actually, it was a <clears throat> a brutal staccato blast of um, of emails and realizations that spread out over several months um, that the new owners of Wild West Exodus, who have been great, and I love what they're doing with the game, but they have no interest in continuing to support the novels that I wrote. So that is um, that is 
between the original rule book, which has all that fluff in it, and then those five books. That's over 600,000 words that I put my heart and soul and lots of, hello there, uh, lots of time and effort into. Um, and they're basically, I mean, they're going to be out there. Uh, Winged Hussar still has the, uh, the opportunity, the option to sell them, uh, but they don't support a, a, a viable, active, living, developing world anymore. Um, and, uh, and they, and they can't, I, we can't write anything further. So none of that can be developed any further either. So that's sort of like a dead end. Um, and so that stunk. Uh, and then I'm, I didn't do a lot of work like at Spartan games. I did a lot of little things here or there, and many of it had already been sort of retconned away by other. They, they decided to go in a different direction, which was less narrative and more history bookish. Um, and so that's that that's that was at the time that I sort of drifted away uh, from them, mostly from writing. I, I still kept in touch for years afterwards. Uh, but but that so that was all gone. And then with uh, Fantasy Flight and Games Workshop parting ways, that was a lot more work that is now defunct and doesn't. So basically, other than a short story here or there and my novel um, Legacy of Shadow and now this fantasy novel that I'm polishing up, um, everything that I wrote basically got wiped away now it didn't get wiped away my wife keeps reminding me whenever i get melancholy about this that it's not wiped away it's still there i have several copies of each book um they're out there you can still buy them from wing to sar uh and and a couple other places as well you can still buy them online from uh, amazon i believe you can still get them from um uh, uh, like barnes and noble online and things like that but on the other hand, those stories are now, they are what they are, and they can't be developed anymore. And that's that's just the way it is. And so um, I have found myself really kind of hesitant to jump into other game systems. And I had already started feeling this way just more from a creative standpoint, um, but... I I really it came to the I, I it sort of struck me that that if I'm writing my own stuff I it's up to me right it's up to me whether I keep writing it if people are it's up to me to make it good enough that people want to read it uh, so that there can be more of it um, if I'm writing in a game system I'm being told what to write I'm being told where the world is and how the world is and and any kind of strange business decision that I have nothing to do with can wipe all that away. And so I, I've been saying no to um, several different opportunities to write for games. Uh, I have, uh, I was in the middle of um, excited talk and negotiations and, and then, um, and this is another thing you have to learn if you want to write anywhere, but in specifically in an industry, you're dealing with people who are running these corporations, these game companies. They're very, very busy. Uh, the fluff, although you think it's awesome and super important, is not the most important thing to them. They're trying to keep the bills paid. They're trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to develop new product. So you have to constantly chase after these people. They're, they'll, they'll be like, oh, yeah, we definitely want you to write for that for us. And then if you leave it at that, you're probably never going to hear from them again. You have to constantly, without being a jerk about it and trying to be nice and positive, you have to constantly put yourself out there. And it was very hard for me to do because that is completely against my personality and my impulses. And it was a long time for me to learn that they weren't going to be upset at that. And I can't tell you how many jobs that I've gotten because I did that. And they were like, oh, yeah, no, I want to. Now, on the other hand, there comes a time when chasing like that becomes exhausting. And there comes a time when you have to kind of accept maybe that company isn't that interested in you. And maybe, you know, maybe your your priorities are, are shifted away from each other. And that's that's a that's kind of a hard call to make uh, when to sort of just sort of let those drift away. But recently to back to my main point, I let them all drift away. 
because I, I really don't want to spend all this time and effort, uh, blood and sweat and creative uh, um, uh, uh, energy and time away from my family to uh, to be writing all this. And then a couple of years later, have somebody else be like, nope, we don't want any of that stuff. So it's all gone. And so uh, that's why, um, well, Adepticon was was an emotional roller coaster for me. That is where the uh, the uh, initial talk about um, ending the podcast as it now is occurred. Uh, and, and that was a little bit of a surprise. And so um, that was I was dealing with that. And then at the same time, I. Um, approached uh, Wing Tassar and was welcomed with open arms back into the fold there. They had kind of let me run uh, for a while on my own to see what I could do. And uh, part of being welcomed back into the fold there was they were very interested in the fantasy novel that I had been talking about. They read it. They really liked it. They bought it. Uh, they really wanted a sequel to uh, Legacy of Shadow. That's super exciting to me. And they had a project. Again, can't talk too much about it, but this is to bring me back to the beginning of this Jever Notice. Uh, realizing what you love about something that you love doing. And what I'm doing right now is awesome and I love it. And what I'm doing is I'm building a world. And I think I've mentioned this a little bit in passing that this new project is a shared world project with multiple published authors. And what's going to happen is we, as a group, got together and we discussed uh, where and when and how and what we wanted it to look like. And and as those conversations progressed, uh, I kind of took a more active leadership role in that group um, only because my imagination was really starting to uh, fire up about this whole process. And so uh, for the last couple of weeks... I've been creating an entire world. Well, not a whole world, not a hemisphere. I've been creating a hemisphere, uh, but including history and characters and political entities and organizations and uh, economies. And and it's very much like preparing for a, uh, for a role-playing campaign is, is, is what I would liken it to the most, except that you have to have everything fully realized because what's happening now i just finished this yesterday actually and handed it in and it's uh it's a big document that has like i said it's got a historical timeline to it it has basically like an encyclopedia entry for every major nation and the organizations those nations have their attitudes towards each other their economies uh who rules them what their attitude uh, all kinds of stuff i had to create that to a depth that I could hand to other authors and say, okay, so here you go. Now I will be writing sort of um, an introduction to this world, a novel that, that that's going to be half story, half travelogue. Hopefully the travelogue will be buried in the story. So you won't notice that it's a travelogue, but it will be a wide ranging um, journey sort of through this new world in this novel that that basically like i said earlier it's a it's all fog of war right i have a vague idea of everything i've got maps i've got all kinds of cool stuff and then i'm going to start sending these characters out into that landscape and forming it up while these other authors have other parts of the world where i did less work because i really wanted them to have ownership of their the sections that they were interested in so i have like all the border countries of their country that they want to deal with and uh, like all that information but then the country they want to deal with the most that's all like left for them to kind of fulfill so that it's more more of um more of a collaborative effort and that's where i am now and i've been talking way too long and uh, as you can tell, probably very excited about this new project. Uh, can't wait to finish up this fantasy novel whose title is atrocious to me uh, when I say it out loud. So uh, I don't even know what its title is going to be, but it's uh, it's a fantasy novel. And I need to finish that up so I can then start working on this new uh, book in this new um, world that I have that we have created and it is not tied to any game it is not tied to any organization other than 
all the fine folks at Winged Hussar and the authors that they have pulled together for this project. So I'm very excited about this. I've been building this world. I can't wait to show it to other people, to explain it to other people. Um, in fact, I'm going to have lunch uh, in a couple days with a bunch of old friends of mine who have been reading the fantasy book. They're going to give me some feedback, and then I'm going to kind of give them a pitch meeting on this world just to see what they think about all the possibilities and story hooks and everything that I built into the world. So uh, that's it for now. Thanks for listening, and Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA Discussions Forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. Awesome. <laughs> you shot like, oh, an easy A, like, oh, you <laughs> saw the word game, and you thought... <laughs> That's right, and it's time to drop the hammer. Now you'll be punished. <laughs> now you shall be punished for your hubris. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I like it. <laughs>